Oh, top left. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's council meeting, Derbyshire Dales District Council. Well, welcome, members. Uh, welcome uh, to one or two guests who are joining us for a couple of items later on in the agenda. And uh, welcome to those members of the public who are watching us on YouTube. Um, Sandra Lamb and I will be uh, controlling the speakers and doing our best to make sure that everyone um, uh, gets their go uh, if they put their hand up uh, to speak on the various items we'll, that we've got. One thing I would ask uh, all members tonight, please, if they could be uh, pertinent, precise and concise as, 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 pos as far as possible in that we've got an, an awful lot of, uh, of questions and, and uh, items on the agenda tonight and I really, really do want to get uh, through uh, all of them, if possible, uh, not just as many as possible, please. And that, that, I think that's quite important tonight. We're first of all going to do a login, and uh, Jackie will take us through that alphabetically to make sure that you can all hear and see me. So I'll hand over to uh, Jackie. Right, evening all. Um, Councillor Allison, can you hear and see? I can hear and see, thank you. Archer? Yes, all Councilor good. Atkin? Yes, thank you, Jackie. Bright? Yes, I can hear. Buckler? Uh, yes. Paul? Yes, thank you. Martin Burfoot? Martin Burfoot, you need to take your mute off. Yeah? Mute, yes, yes. Thank you. Mute. Sue Burfoot. Yes, thank you. Battle. Here. Chapman. Check. Cruz. Yes, thank you. Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly. Yeah. Fitzherbert. Uh, yes, thank you. Flitter. Fine, thanks. Robert. Yes, thanks, Jackie. Vanessa. Fine, thanks. Yes, I'm here. Gamble. Yeah, thanks. Phil. Yes, receiving. Hobson. Thank you, Jackie. Hughes. Yes, thank you. Please. Yes, all good, thanks. McDonough, I don't think she's here. McDonough? Um, not person, Jackie. No. Tony Morley? Yeah, thanks. Michelle Morley? Yes, thanks, Jackie. O'Brien? Yes, thank you. Paulie? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Birdie? Thank you, Jackie, yes. Ratcliffe? Present. Uh, Councillor Rose, I don't think he's here. No. Councillor Salt or Councillor Shirley? Yes, Councillor uh, Ca Shirley, I can hear you, thank oh, you. Council okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Councillor Slack? <laughs> Councillor Slack? Councillor Slack, can you hear me? Can you hear me now, Jackie? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Statham? Yes, I'm here, Jackie. Sutton? Yes. Quindle? Hi, Jackie. Wayne? Yes, thank you. And Wakeman? Yes, can you hear and see? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have the apologies then, please? Oh, yes, just, well, two apologies received from councillors Graham Elliott and Claire Raw. And Can I add McDonough. Councillor McDonough, please? McDonough, yeah. And then, did we have Councillor Salt there and Rose? No. No. Salt, uh, n neither Councillor Salt nor Rose, I don't think. Right, okay. Um, right, thank you very much. Um, just before, thank you for that. Um, just before we carry on, please, Sandra would like to talk about item number 12. Sandra. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, oh, here we are. Very, yes. 
Where is Sandra Lewis? Well, I said we haven't got to be sound, Laura. I think we've got Councillor Rose arriving. I'll just give him a few minutes. There you go. Had a struggle. Councillor Rose, good evening. Good evening. Um, can you just say to, to Jackie you are uh, viewing and hearing us okay? Yes, thank you. Sorry, we had a bit of an argument with the IT. Right, okay. If you can put yourself on mute, please. Great. Uh, we're going straight now to, um, uh, to to Sandra, who's going to talk about item 12 uh, before we start the agenda proper. Sandra. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just to say that uh, very late on this afternoon, I received news from um, the statistician team that I've been working on our development um, projections to say that an ascension algorithm that sought to match electoral figures with population statistics has a flaw in it. That was corrected, but only at 10 to four this afternoon. And I'm not in a position to share that revised data with you because it does affect electoral figures in the wards themselves. So in the circumstances, I'm withdrawing the report and in consultation with the chairman, that's to be rescheduled for the 15th of July to a special meeting. It's unfortunate that because we're working remotely, I can't email you information and I think because of its late arrival, it, you do need to be able to consider that information uh, to see whether it has any impact on your preparations for tonight, as some of those facts may have changed. So sorry, Chair, that report is withdrawn and it will take place at a special meeting on the 15th of July. If I need to uh, issue refresh papers, I will clearly identify where and if there's been any material uh, change to the data already presented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. So obviously, uh, that's two two items that are not on tonight, item 12 and item 13 that Paul sent an email around to everyone. I've just got Councillor Sack, he's put, a, he's put a blue hand up. Was that in error or did you? Uh, okay, we'll try and take that down. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, right, public participation. Uh, we've got various questions uh, now uh, on our agenda. Uh, excuse me, that uh, and Jim is going to put up the questions on, um, and Councillor Purdy is going to answer them. So the first question in public participation, as you know, um, the public come into our meetings and sit at the desk and, and say them, uh, but we have got one or two tonight. And the first one is in relation to item four, 14, and it's from the World Community. And as you can see, it's about the decision-making uh, recovery plan. Now, hopefully you've all seen a copy of these. And um, uh, Jim has got it up on the screen now. And uh, this is about uh, the application 18 stroke 01242 stroke EIA. Uh, can I ask Councillor Purdy to give his response? Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, thank you from the Welsh Committee uh, for your question. Um, you can see the uh, questions quite clearly on screen, so I think that will help. Uh, the answer is none of us can be absolutely certain what will happen in respect to the current COVID-19 restrictions and the ability to hold full meetings of the Council and its committees in person. However, the Council recognises that this application will generate a great deal of public interest when it is ready to be determined and that this would be best served, serviced through a public meeting of the planning committee. It is not the intention of the council to bring this application before a virtual meeting of the planning committee. Uh, this re-emphasizes a promise I made some time ago. As per the answer to question one, the council recognizes that the amount of public interest in this planning application will require robust public participation. Whilst none of us can guarantee the future in relation to COVID-19 restrictions, it is the intention of the Council to enable this through a face-to-face -face meeting of the Planning Committee if possible. The applicant has been asked to undertake analysis on the impacts of the development on the Bentley Brook catchment, and this will be made available to the Environment Agency and the lead local flood authority prior to the application being considered by the committee. Those agencies' opinions on the adequacy or otherwise of the assessment will form part of the officer's report, 
and will be considered by the planning committee. The next question, please, Jim. So thank you to Miss Lynn Irving for your question. As you can see, it's on screen. The response is the council has responded to the concerns surrounding the use of glyphosate by significantly reducing its use by our clean and green team. It is now only used in certain situations by staff wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment and with no members of the public present. Although the council's weed spray, spraying contractor is still using glyphosate, discussions are underway to consider a suitable alternative. We are currently in year two of a three-year contract. Our clean and green team have contributed, sorry, I beg your pardon, have continued to trial and review alternative treatments, and we remain committed to finding a suitable alternative. At the present time, there are two products currently being assessed and two more arriving this month. A report on this matter will be presented to members in September. Thank you, Jim. So the next question, as you can see on screen, thank you, Miss Hilary Hart of Grindleford. The response is, the council has responded to the concerns surrounding the use of glyphosate, and you will see this is identical answer, but I will read it out, to the use of glyphosate by significantly reducing its use by our clean and green team. It is now only used in certain situations by staff wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment and with no members of the public present. Although the council's weed spraying contractor is still using glyphosate, discussions are underway to consider a suitable alternative. We are currently in year two of a three-year contract. Our clean and green team have continued to trial and review alternative treatments, and we remain committed to finding a suitable alternative. At this present time, there are two products currently being assessed and two more arriving this month. A report on this matter will be presented to members in September. And the final public question. Thanks to Mr. Dobbs from Ashbourne for this question. The response is, the Council's ability to publish its annual air quality status report has been impacted by the pandemic, not least by the fact that the laboratory that we use to analyse our monitoring devices was closed early in lockdown. That laboratory subsequently reopened and the results that we have received back from them have been made available. Officers are now working with DEFRA to agree the final submissions of the status report and the report will be published as soon as DEFRA have confirmed that they're happy for this to happen. Whilst we haven't given a firm timescale, officers do not expect there will be a long delay. That's the end of questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we might move on to item three, interest. Nothing's been tabled or, or put before the committee team, so I take it there are no uh, interests. Item four, approval of the minutes of previous meetings and uh, in, consultation, in consultation with um, uh, uh, with the committee team, I think uh, uh, we, we can avoid doing a, a complete roll call as is uh, the procedure here. And so I, I'll, I'll take those as read and if there are no objections uh, to them, I'll take that they are then approved if I may. No objections, thank you very much. Uh, if we can move on then to item five, which is the leader's announcements, Councillor Purdy. Thank you again, Chairman. In remarking on the awful death of George Floyd, I would like to reiterate that Derbyshire Dales District Council condemns racism. We work to promote equality across the Derbyshire Dales. Indeed, we have a statutory duty to eliminate unlawful discrimination, foster good relations, and advance equality of opportunity in our district. The District Council adopted a Dignity and Respect for All policy in 2006, which states that Derbyshire Dales District Council believes that everyone has the right to dignity and respect as part of their everyday lives, promotes and encourages dignity and respect in the community, is committed to challenging anything that undermines this basic right. I have been contacted by a young concerned constituent asking us to consider actions in support of Black Lives Matter. I promise to carefully consider this and will ensure that a motion to the full council is prepared for the September meeting, which I hope will receive full support. For any member that did not see the pictures, I can confirm that the town hall 
was lit up in purple on Wednesday 17th of June to illustrate the District Council's commitment to challenge racism and inequality. Since I reported to you last members on the first Council's virtual meeting, uh, 30th of April, I've been extremely busy on one software platform form or another, with meetings involving the Chief Executive on a weekly basis, together with Councillor Sir Robson, Deputy Leader. Also meetings with Derbyshire leaders, Vision Derbyshire, Chase Chesterfield HS2 Board, Derbyshire Economic Partnership, Derbyshire Economic Recovery Board, East Midlands Councils, District Council Network, and MHCLG on today with the LGA, with the Right Honourable Robert Jenrick, MP, on screen. There is an awful lot of work happening as a result of the emergency situation we're faced with, and it is putting huge pressure on local authorities like ours. COVID-19 has brought sad loss to many people, and our thoughts and prayers go out to all that have suffered as a consequence. It is important that we continue to pay tribute to frontline staff, such as the NHS and essential workers, who have been under much pressure since March of this year. The real threat of a second wave of COVID-19 should be of concern to every individual in the country with its threat to life and limb. One other impact of COVID-19, of course, is the impact to the economy. Jobs and prosperity at risk. And out of all the meetings I've been involved with, I would say that an important one is the start-up of the Derbyshire Economic Recovery Board. The board consists of Derbyshire leaders, chief execs and captains of industry, tourism, construction, etc. The specific aim, of course, is to help kickstart the economy in Derbyshire, and I believe this joined up approach is a step in the right direction in order to see exactly what is required to get normal business back as quickly as possible. On Monday, 22nd of June, Bakewell Market opened for the first time since lockdown in March, and it's open to high praise. Comments not only from the Bakewell Ward members, but also members of the public, but more importantly, it received eye accolade from Mr. Joe Arison, Chief Executive of the National Market Storeholders Federation, who said it was a fine exemplar in the country as to how to safely open an outdoor market. Our staff to serve I praise therefore for all the hard work put in to opening up the market and ensuring the safety of all concerned. Finally, I need to emphasize please that COVID-19 is still amongst us and it is a real danger. You have seen the news with Leicester, we have pockets in Derbyshire. I urge the public very strongly to be extremely weary of this lethal virus and to respect and consider others around you in the way you behave in order to keep people safe and help start, stop the spread of the virus. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to item six, Chairman's announcements. Councillor Tony Morley, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's all been fairly quiet, as you can imagine, but I'm just putting the finishing touches to the Chairman's charity, which currently stands at £675 and is going to cancer research. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Morley. And so now we move on to um, maiden speeches. Um, as you know, you're now familiar with this process now, and we've, we've got three members tonight. We'll take them in alphabetical order, please. Uh, so it's three minutes, please. And Councillor Archer is first. Councillor Archer. Thank you, Chair. I love Ashbourne and I love the Derbyshire Dales. I lived in the area for all but four years of my life. And when our first child was born in 2004, while I was working overseas in Malaysia, we decided to move home into the Dales, as it's such a fantastic place to have a family. And we certainly have not regretted that decision. However, nowhere is perfect. And as the Brexit bus with its lies printed brazenly all over it crashed into our society and began to open up huge divisions, I became increasingly concerned about the direction that we as a country were heading in. Hate crime went through the roof nationally at a local level. People I regarded as friends were posting things on social media about immigrants, Muslims and foreigners that made me deeply concerned. Having studied history and politics at university and taught both subjects to a huge variety of children and students for the last 26 years, I was concerned that we were forgetting what history teaches us about the dangers of nationalism. And I felt it should try to, I should try to do something about it by using my passion for history and politics to try and make a stand for ideals that I hold dear as a liberal, tolerance, equality, and diversity. While canvassing for votes, I met a Polish man who was nearly in tears on his doorstep as he told me he no longer felt welcome and he was gonna to have to leave. Just a few doors down, another man told me how England should be for the English and that immigration was to blame for all his problems. 
Fast forward just over a year and Brexit is seemingly done and the nationalist element of our society that it has awakened feels even more empowered. The level of resistance that I see to the admirable um, Black Lives Matter movement, both across the country but also in my own hometown, only emphasises further how much work we have to do to create a society where people of all backgrounds feel equally welcome and comfortable. Seeing Derbyshire Dales residents trying to undermine the Black Lives Matter movement by circulating posts on social media calling for all mosques to be closed down because of the historic Islamic slave trade and taking the law into their own hands to protect a historic pub sign that is indisputably offensive to black people highlights the fact that the issues of tolerance, equality and diversity need to be addressed at a local level. As I said at the start, I love Ashbourne and the Dales, but I don't love the fact that black and Asian friends and colleagues of mine tell me that they feel uneasy visiting your beautiful town or that they would love to live in the Dales but do not feel like they belong here. That's why one of my priorities, while I'm fortunate enough to represent the people of Ashbourne South, will to be ensure that the voices of the liberal minded people of Ashbourne and the Dales are heard and understood, and that people of all colours and creeds feel more welcome and accepted when they choose to visit and hopefully even live in our district. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit everyone, but the BAME community have been hit hardest, and never has it been more apparent how much the NHS needs the BAME and EU staff to protect us all. Indeed, both of the Prime Minister's intensive care nurses were migrants. The economic damage of the lockdown means that now more than ever we need to project a positive image to attract more businesses, visitors and residents into the Dales to ensure a healthy economy and to revive our flailing high streets to ensure a secure future for our children. Dealing with the black's head in a sensitive and appropriate manner is a great opportunity to start this process and repair the damage done by the articles and the local and national press. I'm therefore pleased to see Councillor Atkins motion on tonight's agenda and I very much hope that all political groups on this council can embrace this opportunity to promote, to promote Ashbourne and the Dales as a tolerant place that champions equality and diversity and is sensitive to the feelings and experiences of all people, whether they be residents or visitors to our fantastic district. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now moving on to Councillor Buttle. Councillor Buttle. Hi. Um, it's been a year now that I uh, been on the council and we declared an emergency, uh, climate emergency within weeks and that cheered me up. I was given a very generous welcome and I thank you all for it. I have to say I don't feel I've made much difference though. I'm hoping that next year will be better. Our current 2% energy efficiency savings target for the year 2021 is not the sort of ambition I was hoping for. I find the lack of urgency to be very concerning. We know that climate change is not going to go away, it's going to get worse, and it's going to be central to our lives for generations. We know we need to change the way we live, and we know we need to do it now. Anyway, I've got a dozen recent Environment Guardian headlines to encourage us on our way. So you might spot a theme, because so we'll start with. Climate science, worst case scenarios, may not go far enough, new cloud studies show. Modelling suggests the climate is considerably more sensitive to carbon emissions than previously thought. And this, poultry farms have turned the River Wye into a wildlife death trap. The phosphate rich runoff from free range chickens is causing the spread of algal blooms that devastate the ecosystem. Here, insect numbers are down 25% since 1990. Scientists say insects are vital and losses worrying, and the declines are accelerating across Europe. Our research shows that the South Pole is warming three times faster than the rest of the world, says the British Antarctic Survey. The badger call in England is to be extended to 11 new areas, 64,000 animals likely to be killed this autumn. Here's a good one. Pacific Gas and Electricity confessed on Tuesday to killing 84 people in a devastating wildfire that wiped out paradise. YouGov, 93% of the UK public supports a green recovery from the coronavirus crisis. The UK butterfly season is off to an unusually early start after the sunniest of springs. The UN envoy says climate change will hit harder and faster than expected. The Transport Secretary promised not to levy green taxes when EasyJet was given a £600 million coronavirus bailout. Water firms, 
discharged raw sewage into England's rivers 200,000 times in 2019. And finally, one last one. It does definitely apply to us. Thousands of tonnes of single-use plastics are discarded by the public in English parks every week. Well, as that'll do for now, I think, but I'd like to point out we can make a difference, and thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you for making it three minutes, more or less, exactly. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Michelle Morley. Councillor Morley. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Good evening, members, ladies and gentlemen. A Polish greeting for you. Dobry wieczór. Good evening. Rather than talking about myself or my ward or, or the current dreadful COVID, I'd like to tell you a short story about a family from Poland, which is very close to my heart. The story begins in Krakow in Poland prior to the beginning of the Second World War. Three brothers in the Edech family from a small village of Branica found life extremely difficult. My understanding is that they had different opinions about communism and a future, and shall we say a different way of life. These opinions did result in discourse for a time within the family. But the elder of the three brothers decided that the time was right to attempt to escape from the regime that Poland had to endure. One has no idea how hard this must have been, and I can now only share some of the experiences and also make some childhood references to a small part of this story. It should be borne in mind that life was extremely hard living in Poland prior to the Second World War. My Polish family has now found uh, some diary entries recently, um, which are currently being translated. And my understanding is that some parts of the transcripts so far appear disturbing. The elder brother of the family of whom I'm speaking is my dearly beloved father, Marianne Idech. My father escaped from Poland in the clothes he stood up in and walked across Europe taking advantage of lifts and hospitality where he could. As you can imagine, this journey must have been extremely tough and testing. There are some graphic details of his long journey, but too lengthy for this evening. At a young age, 19 to 20, when daddy arrived in, in England, he successfully joined the RAF. He served in the Second World War and rapidly trained as a pilot and flew a bow fighter aircraft as a night fighter in 219 Polish Squadron. He was a man with a clear goal, determination to achieve to a successful end. In times of war, who knows what the brave men thought about when their sorties had ended and were trying to snatch some sleep. My husband and I have spent several hours reading his logbook, only reading words, not emotions, positive words, often recorded, but also some very moving remarks. We're so proud that Daddy's medals and various memorabilia is now housed in the RAF Museum at Tangmere, near Bognor Regis. Thank you to my husband for arranging this display. We used to take the monthly Reader's Digest magazine in our family, and I remember sitting with my father for many hours, reading the words usage and abusage, so he could learn a little bit more about the English language. Despite being a wartime fighter pilot, his skills and attributes extended way beyond those of being under instruction in wartime. He cared about all his crew, his navigators and colleagues. As a child, I recall being told that one should always behave in a manner that was conducive to being honest, true, care about your actions and deeds, and hope I have, I have inherited some of these. As time went by, I understood how difficult it was for my father to adapt to the English way of life. In order to integrate to England, he changed his surname. He had the fillings removed in his teeth. It used to be black in Poland, and then he had them changed to silver, as, as we always had in England. He had an enormous desire to be accepted. He worked hard at this and his determination and resolve 
fortitude, as well as the unfailing desire to be successful, resulted in him developing a successful family business in the upholstery line. We travelled to Poland in 1968, and that was the first time that my father returned after the war, which was very difficult, but that's really another story for another time. To like, I'd like to end by saying I am extremely proud to be half Polish. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, bardzo dziękuję, dobranoc, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Morley. Um, moving on to number eight, the committees. Again, I'd like to take these as read, and uh, I'd, I'd rather not take a, a full roll call on that. So unless I hear any objections in the next few seconds, can I take them all as passed and approved? Thank you very much. And now we get on to item nine, questions. Now, you've all been, these are marked up alphabetically. And uh, the, Jim is going to share the screen with us. Um, and the first question is question A, and that's from uh, Councillor Joyce Pawley. And as you will remember, members uh, and those of you watching on YouTube, uh, the councillor who's asked the question is allowed to ask a supplementary question arising from the original question. So I'll now hand over to Councillor Purdy to give his response. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Pawley, for your question. Councillor Pawley is correct in stating that the Community and Environment Committee resolved on 30th of October 2019 that the designation of the car park at Ode Station Close Rosley as a temporary site for the Traveller family to whom the Council owes a homeless duty should have been reviewed in February 2020. The fact that it wasn't was an oversight. The circumstances around that matter are that very shortly after the meeting on 30th of October 2020, the family that had been on site at Rosalie moved of their own accord to the ABC at Bakewell in order to, to support a terminally ill family member who was receiving care from a Bakewell GP, a care home in Bakewell and Asgate Hospice. At that point, the emphasis on officers was to manage the encampment at Bakewell and to attempt to secure an order to move the family back to Rosalie. Members are aware that the court declined to grant such an order until after the family member passed away in February 2020, such that the family was still on site at Bakewell at the time of the February committee meeting. Shortly after the family member passed away, the council returned to court and were granted a possession order, but with clear instructions from the judge that the order must not be implemented until such time as the movement restrictions introduced in response to the COVID-19 were lifted. The family therefore remained on site at the ABC. During the lockdown period, further travel of families arrived on site culminating in a significant gathering of travellers on the ABC and showground early in June. It was thought that these families would otherwise have been attending Appleby Horse Fair. In any event, the travellers then on site made it clear they had no intention of leaving in the foreseeable future, and officers believed they had little option but to seek a further court order covering land in both the council's control and in the control of BAHS. This order was obtained on 12th June and the travellers were evicted from the site on Wednesday 17th of June. In the absence of an alternative site, the family was directed to Rosalie and the remaining travellers on site were not offered a site at all. Members will be aware that they set up on private land in the vicinity and officers have been involved in further discussions around this issue. It is believed that this group has now left the district. In all this activity, officers had not presented a report to committee seeking a review of the Rosalie site. However, the options available to them had not changed since the October 2019 report. There is still no agreement on a permanent site at this time, and the temporary site option remains as stated in the October report, Rosalie, or Middleton Road, Worksworth. Of these two, Rosalie is more suitable. 
Having said that, I have asked officers to bring a report to the next available meeting of the Community Environment Committee updating on all traveller issues. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Pawley has uh, a right for a supplementary. Councillor Pawley. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, under policy HC6 of the adopted local plan, we're obliged to find a permanent traveller site for nine pitches. Years later, we're still able, unable to provide that site. Meanwhile, the family have been moved an unconscionable number of times. The leader of the council described this matter as his number one priority. Bearing this in mind, it would seem that an approach we have not tried previously might be called for. Has the leader of the council in mind, or would he consider contemplating the announcement of a timetabled date, which would instigate a more stringent approach to the procurement of land? Thank you, Councillor Purdy. I've got no problem with that, Councillor Paulie. I'm sure you realise that I need to discuss that with officers. Uh, as I said, there is a report coming to CNE. Uh, I'm not prepared to go into detail at the moment, but there will be some offers of sites uh, to consider as a permanent site on that meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I now ask question B is from Councillor Butler, and you'll see that on the screen now. Uh, it's going to do with the Travel fam family. And uh, I'll ask Councillor Purdy to give his response, please. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Buckler. I'll, you'll agree with me that it's an identical question and the answer therefore to what I've just given Councillor Paul is, is identical. Um, you also asked officers to address the issues you've raised about the businesses at the White Peak Loop in their report to the next Community Environment Committee. So that will be addressed. Thank you. Councillor Butler has uh, the right of a supplementary. Councillor Butler. Uh, yeah, as I understand it, all movements on the provision of a permanent traveller site has once again stalled. Uh, this council has for years now experienced great difficulty in procuring the land for a new site, in spite of the declaration of homelessness by the family. And this has led to the wholly unacceptable situation of vulnerable members of our community living in a car park for extended periods of time. Will the leader of the council say if more stringent measures including the use of compulsory purchase powers, might now be considered to bridge the, to solve the problem that is causing great distress to both traveller and settled communities. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. It is something I've discussed with Tim Braun and the Chief Exec uh, about compulsory purchase. Uh, we're not running the option out, but we obviously have to consider the Council's finances and that cheaper options might be that we own land and it might be more suitable for, to find a permanent site on, on our land that we own. Thank you very much. We now move on to uh, question C, which you'll see on your screen right now, and that's from Councillor Slack. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's a renewable carbon free by 2030 and renewable energy projects question. Councillor Purdy, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your question, Councillor Slack. At its meeting on 19th of February 2020, the Community and Environment Committee approved delegated authority for the head of regulator services to procure expertise for the formulation of the council's climate change strategy and action plan. That work was put out to quotation and during lockdown, a consultancy firm was appointed to undertake this piece of work. The consultancy is named Clear Lead. Clear Lead have met virtually with key officers and with the council's climate change working group in order to assist with the formulation of the strategy and action plan. They have received detailed information on the Council's energy and fuel use and have undertaken a socially distanced tour and inspection of some of the Council's key assets and facilities. They are now calculating the Council's carbon footprint. From a combination of all this work, they will then draft the strategy and action plan. We expect the strategy to set out the steps needed to achieve net zero by 2030 and to identify opportunities for renewable energy and electric and similar vehicles. The strategy and action plan will be reported to committee once received. Uh, Councillor Slack, your supplementary, please. I've lost you. you. Where are you?
Hold on, Council Slack, we've got to unmute you. Wait, 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 wait. Can you unmute yourself? Great. You're, can you start again, please, Councillor Slack? We missed yeah. that. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Birdie, for your reply. Uh, but um, it is, uh, we're getting now into uh, only eight and a half years left before we get to 2030. And um, we're, I would like to see some changes in the vehicles. I think this is the first, probably first priority, really, to get to switching from diesel and petrol to electric vehicles and getting some points at uh, depots at Rosalie. Uh, I don't know if there's any there yet. Uh, that's one of the questions, really. And also the other question was, uh, do you believe we're we on course then for 2030? Thank you, Councillor Purdy. I think we're on course. Uh, it will accelerate as soon as we get clear leads, final report, which Council will uh, be able to judge. Uh, and in the stream of uh, options, obviously electric vehicles is mentioned, I'm aware solar farms are being considered and lots of other options. I know these have been contributed by members. It's not rocket science, but it's certainly coming out of the Climate Change Working Group and certainly coming out of the Clear Leads uh, consultancy work. Okay. Thank you very much. We now move on to question D, which is from Councillor Wayne, and that's about towns and parks and public disorder uh, locally. So, Councillor, it's now on your screen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Wayne. The Derbyshire Dales has always been an area which attracts eye visitor numbers, and we've always taken pride in being able to provide a welcoming environment. We are already work with the police, and in particular, the local Safer Neighbourhoods teams, and ensuring that it remains a safe place for visitors and residents alike. Antisocial behaviour can be and is addressed by the local SNTs, and the new sergeant is keen to expand on that collaborative work through the use of our public spaces protection orders. Our officers are currently working towards making that happen by putting in place the necessary supporting processes, such as standardized penalty forms, payment portals, and associated administration. I have every reason to believe that such a collaboration will work well and be equally well received by our residents. I have in fact been recently contacted by the new chief inspector of communities uh, and I will be holding a meeting with there very soon. Thank you, Councillor Wayne, your supplementary. Yes, thank you, Councillor Purdy. Um, yes, the area is welcoming. What I'm concerned about is the large number of people that may come into the parks on any staycation. And what I am, uh, I appreciate, I've been in touch with uh, Mr Postlethwaite in relation to this matter. Uh, I'd just like to know what systems have been put in place in the park to try and um, ease tension if, if it comes with uh, distancing, etc. And also, I would like to, I, I personally believe that the use of these orders, effectively used and managed, will be of use to tackle and minimise outbreaks of police disorder. So will you seek to extend the public space protection orders when appropriate to areas such as Matlock and Matlock Bath railway stations, these car parks and other areas in the district which are an issue of antisocial use of motor vehicles and I think that we need to be a bit smarter in the use of these orders personally. Will you seek to extend them when appropriate please? That's the party. I will certainly seek to investigate and evidence base that, Councillor Wayne, and that will be one of my conversations with the new Chief Inspector, but I'll certainly look into it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, question E is from Councillor Gamble, and there's uh, three aspects to this uh, question, as you'll all see uh, on your screen, uh, as you can see the application uh, and a planning application and others. Well, is that on the screen? So this is question E from Councillor Gamble. Just waiting for it to come on screen again. Cheers. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I beg your pardon. It's not, it's, yeah. Okay, it's so there. here's, here's Councillor Gamble's question um, E, as I said. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Well, the three questions you say. The first one, the response is as follows. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Gamble. The response to the coronavirus pandemic from this authority has not receded. Significant resources have still been dedicated to supporting businesses through the administration of the discretionary grants fund. 
the development and implementation of measures to ensure the safe reopening of the high street, including licensed premises and other aspects of community and economic recovery. The District Council is not, therefore, in a business as usual situation. Proposals for the resumption of the District Council's Policy Committee will be considered at the annual meeting on 22nd of July. Does Councillor Gamble want to ask the supplementary to this first one, Chair? Uh, do you want to ask, Councillor Gamble, do you want to ask, a, 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 if we take them one at a time, that might be best. Yeah, Councillor Gamble, your supplementary, <laughs> you have, for each question, you have a supplementary. So your, your first one, please. Okay. Um, so on the 22nd of July, will we have a date for the, each policy committee to come back? I believe so. I'm looking at Sandra on screen. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. So the second question uh, is about the Emergency Committee and an independent review. Councillor Purdy. Thank you again. An investigation has begun to, one, establish a factual timeline of events which resulted in the removal, removal of the Black said Ashbourne and its safe return to the custody of the District Council. Two, to clarify the capacity of individuals involved and the source of leak authority of any permission granted. The investigation team guided by the monitoring officer will include members of the internal legal team and will be independently reviewed by one of the council's appointed independent persons. The time frame for completion is by 31st of August, 2020. Councillor Gamble. Right. Okay, it's something else to do with the events around it, really. Um, why was the first and to date only communication to councillors regarding the events of June the 8th, an immediate email asking them not to talk to, asking them not to talk to the press? Does the authority see this primarily as an issue of concern to residents or a PR matter? Councillor Purdy. I'm not going to respond, Councillor Gamble. As I said, there's an independent inquiry and it's only right and proper that that uh, uh, carries on with its business um, and you see the outcome of that report when done. Okay, so the third, the third question from Councillor Gamble is about uh, uh, Bayer and the settlement and... and uh, the case of Roundup and glyphosate. Councillor Purdy. Thank you again. Thank you, Chair. Well, we've touched on this before. The response the Council has responded to the concerns surrounding the use of glyphosate by significantly reducing its use by a clean and green team. It is now only used in certain situations by staff wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment and with no members of the public present. Although the council's weed spraying contract is still using glyphosate, discussions are underway to consider a suitable alternative. We are currently in year two of a three year contract. Our clean and green team have continued to trial and review alternative treatments, and we remain committed to finding a suitable alternative. At this present time, there are two products currently being assessed and two more arriving this month. A report on this matter will be presented to members in September. That's the gamble. Right, my actual question was whether the council had changed its stance at all in in, in, in after the um, announcement in the press about the 8.8 .8 billion to settle claims. So yes or no, at present, does the council see um, glyphosate as something that's that is could, 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 sorry that goes with the health and safety of residents, wildlife, and domestic animals? Yes or no, is it safe? Councillor Purdy. It's safe in the factors I've just reported that it's used in very safe with trained uh, staff and with no public present. And we've reduced its uh, use. Okay. Thank you very much for those questions. Question F is from Peter Slack again. It's going to come up on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you again, Councillor Slack. Councillor Slack will now be aware that there is a proposal of a notice of motion to be considered this evening, which acknowledges that as a district council, we have a duty to address the legacy of colonialism, slavery and racism in all its forms. We acknowledge the public outcry of hurt, pain and anger over these legacies. And it is proposed in the motion that we undertake a review of all our own assets and a report be brought back to full council on completion. 
it will be for members to consider the scope of that review. The District Council cannot, however, be responsible for assets that are owned by others, and it is for them to determine what actions they propose to take on such matters. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Slack, you have a right to a supplementary. Where have you gone? I've lost you. That's it, I'm unmuted now. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Purdy, for your reply. Um, yes, the review, uh, I would like to see um, a lot of uh, black and Asian and minorities people taking part in this review. I know the council assets, but visitors to the area are from all kinds of, all over the country. So really they want a true representation of the people that they affect most, which are a black, Asian and minority group. So I think a review should be, representatives should take part on that in my view. Thank you. Councillor Thank Purdy. Councillor Thank you, Chair. We will be going out to outside appropriate external organisations to help us with that council slide. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Very good. So question G is again from Councillor Matthew Butler, and it's up on your screen about um, the climate change emergency. So, Councillor Purdy, please. Uh, sorry, Councillor Buck, I'm referring you to early responses, and that's the one just to Councillor Slack. I should add that we expect the work that we're doing with our consultants will enable us to identify the carbon savings made by the council over the last five years, as well as the potential for future savings. Thank you. Councillor Butler. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for that. Um, can you tell me what currently is our carbon footprint and how does it compare to the one of a year ago? And what does decisions, uh, both relating to uh, internal operations and the external ones for which we have responsibility, have been altered in the interim period to reduce it? I can't give you the answer at the moment, Councillor Buckler, because I'm aware that the Clear Lead team have been doing those investigations, though I'm happy to uh, email you and all other members if you're satisfied with that answer. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And question H. Uh, is from Councillor O'Brien, um, and it's to do by it's to do with irresponsible use of disposable barbecues. Um, Thank Hardy. you, Councillor O'Brien. Um, whilst I agree that this is an important matter, I cannot agree that it is urgent to the point where we may need to derail other activities and misdirect resources that are currently stretched in dealing with a range of issues around the pandemic. Discussion on the item will be more timely when the council returns to normal business through the committee cycle. Councillor O'Brien. I don't think I need to respond to that uh, answer. Thank you. Okay. I just give you Thank assurance. You very much. Thank you. Thank. I'd just like to give assurance that it will be followed up. Yeah. Thank you very much and thank you members for all the questions. So now we move on to a proposal of a notice of, of motion and I'm going to ask Councillor Atkin to introduce his motion. Councillor Atkin. Uh, yes, thank you Chair. Um, just hope this will get support around the Chamber. I think it's something that we should do and it's been uh, mentioned in uh, Councillor Stack's question and of course Councillor Purdy gave his reply to it. So I've reflected on the motion since submitting it and want to propose the motion as is but with the deletion of the word in the separate paragraph after completion of the review. I think it's important that we make a decision and we take one step at a time and have the opportunity to consider matters fully. So um, do you want me to read the uh, motion out, Sandra? Yes, please. Yes, please. Right. So um, given what we have seen in other boroughs, districts and local government authorities around the UK in recent weeks, we have a duty to address the legacy of colonialism, slavery and racism in all its forms. We acknowledge the public outcry of hurt, pain and anger over these legacies and that we undertake a review of all our assets and a report brought back to full council uh, on completion of the review. So the, the motion is as that. Thank you, okay. Chair. Can I go to Councillor Finesse, please? Just unmute myself. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to commend this excellent motion and second the amendment. Uh, I'd like to go to Councillor Sue Burford, I've got next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I absolutely agree with the sentiments of this motion, and I know that our group will certainly support it. Um, I've got a 
couple of questions, actually. I'm not really very clear what we're actually asking our officers to do and when we're expecting it, when we're expecting them to do it, given that, you know, that they are under a lot of pressure at the moment. Having said that, this is an important issue. Um, the other thing I was going to say, not knowing that the motion was going to be amended, was um, I wasn't particularly happy about asking our officer to make judgments when they make their recommendations. I think that's um, not something that we should be asking them to do. So I'm uh, pleased that that uh, has been deleted from the motion. Okay, thank you very much. I've got Councillor Mike Ratcliffe next, please, Mike. Yes, thank you, Chair. You, you'd think uh, at this point I would be on my soapbox uh, and uh, supporting this wholeheartedly, but in fact, I'm a little bit circumspect. Uh, the motion does seem on the face of it to be very laudable. Uh, it shows solidarity with uh, those who want to uh, a firmer stance for racism and discrimination, particularly uh, in uh, our uh, 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 district, uh, as it were. Um, you know, we, we, we all of us want to show support for the oppressed and victimized minorities. But the danger here, I feel, is that this is far too focused and is deflecting really from what should be this council's primary response, which is to have a well-resourced, consolidated... So, so one, um, one, sorry, I beg your pardon, sorry. Can, uh, we've just lost Councillor Statham. Can we just um, see if he's, he's back, please? Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Councillor Ratcliffe. He's but... back into the room, Councillor. We're just waiting for him to connect to audio. Okay. You there? You're back, Councillor Statham. I'm here. Right, so Councillor Ratcliffe, I beg your pardon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. My position is that we really should be putting our resources into, as I say, a much more um, uh, supportive, broad uh, and consolidated policy uh, that is going to be proactive uh, across the board and is very importantly going to be supported uh, by those residents and members of the BAME uh, groups. Uh, ethnic minorities have to be, uh, not just need, but they have to be involved in those actions that are directly affecting them. Um, there's no doubt that there is a very much uh, a groundswell of opinion now, uh, a public outcry against the hurt, pain and anger that our imperial past and indeed the perceived commemoration of the exploitation of black people uh, has produced. Um, but this particular um, uh, motion, as I say, is really not addressing those broader issues. It's far too restricted as it is to district council assets. The other point is that there's a, an unfortunate subjectivity here that we can't get away from that is very much open to question. Um, who's going to carry out this assessment? I'm, I'm being rhetorical, but no, presumably it's the members and officers of an all white authority. And what criteria are they going to use? Um, uh, what what um, uh, accent and role are they going to put on heritage and conservation, which are important issues, of course, in, in, in the district. Uh, those decisions uh, about the of scrutinizing assets need to encompass all the sensitivity that these objects engender for the uh, black and ethnic uh, uh, groups here. So uh, although I'm very sure that the essence of the motion is well motivated, if this council is going to be genuinely behind the Black Lives Matter movement and determined to eradicate racism and discrimination, then we need much more than a simple gesture like, to, like this. And I would have suggested uh, an amendment that actually brings in a consultation and approval, if you like, with members 
of the BAME communities, and that this report forms the basis of a precursor to a more comprehensive anti-racism motion that the leader, uh, Councillor Purdy, uh, alluded to right at the beginning. And I was very pleased to hear that, that we are going to address this in detail in September. But I would suggest if we're doing this, that report needs to be behind uh, 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 that full motion. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to uh, um, vote against it, but I just feel that we, we should be aware that this is, at the end of the day, no more than a gesture. It is not a, a, a solution by any means. Okay, thank you very much. Just just for a procedural point, ladies and gentlemen, if I've clicked, if you, I've seen your hands and I've, I've put them down, I've written my list here along with Sandra. So uh, the, the next one I've got is Councillor Archer, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I, I just start off by saying that I, I'm, I will also be supporting uh, this motion, but I do also support a lot of what Councillor Ratcliffe said there, and I would have very hope, much hope that this motion is uh, the start of a bigger uh, movement and a bit, a bit more more action by the council. It's great that we are acknowledging it, and I and I and I really support the fact that we're acknowledging this issue. Um, but I hope it is very much the starting point, and and um, we build build on this rather than thinking right, we tick that box and we can move on. We certainly cannot allow that to be to be the case, and, and just just see it in that way. Um, I have one other um, point to make as well, which. As I said, I will support this. As I said on my my um, my, um, my maiden speech at the st at the start, I think it's really important, and I do support it. But I do have an issue with the fact that in the first sentence, we say that given what we've seen in other boroughs, um, and I'm, I'm a bit concerned that that seems to suggest that we feel we don't necessarily have a problem in our own borough, um, in our own district. And I think when you look at what happened in Ashbourne um, over with the Black's Head and, and, um, and I believe there's also been issues in works with as well from what I've, I've picked up. Um, I think it's a bit unfortunate that um, what, is, what is a very good motion that I do support could be accused of, of um, ignoring and turning a blind eye to what's happened in our, in our own district here in relation to this matter. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to go as far as to suggest amendment, an amendment because I don't want to do anything that might might derail the motion, which broadly is, is in line with what I support. But I, I was just a bit concerned that, that it, it seemed to be saying other boroughs and there's clearly been issues closer to home. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We've got plenty of people who want to speak. Councillor Allison is next and then Gamble. Councillor Allison. Thank you, Chair. Well, I understand the intent of the motion. What needs to be made clear is that Racism is not a legacy. It's here and now, and is faced by all non-white British people on a daily basis. Racism is also more than assets. It's about behaviours. The institutional racism regularly encountered in organisations many of us come into contact with prevents us from accessing good quality healthcare educational opportunities and the protection from the police that we deserve. And you may have noticed I said we. There's been mentioned and it's said again tonight that this is a white council, it is not. I am mixed race, my heritage is white Asian. The events in Ashbourne have made me feel uncomfortable and alienated. I do not support this motion because it fails to address the fundamental issue of inequality. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Gamble, you're next. I mean, really, all I can do is absolutely completely and wholeheartedly support what Councillor Allison said. She's completely right. To talk about racism if it's in the past, I mean, are we not also, as, as Councillor Archer said, you know, <laughs> To, to start off the first sentence of the motion saying in other boroughs, when we all know this was started off by something that happened in our own borough, I, I think is somewhat uh, an unfortunate start to sort of something which I, I can see it started off well and was well meaning. But again, I mean, and when you when you tackle issues like this, 
it is not just an end result. We are not looking for a piece of paper at the end of this or some sort of solution. This is process as well. And if the people who we're talking, you know, if we aren't involving the public and other members in this, then we are not doing a process. We are just doing um, a piece of paper that acknowledges the idea of this, but really does nothing to address it. And um, it's a shame. I think it's a missed opportunity that maybe with a little bit more consultation with other people could have been made into a good motion. But I, unfortunately, I, I don't think we have a good motion in front of us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Chapman, then I've got Bright. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask at, at what level we intend to distance ourselves from, from these issues. Um, I mean, we have a we have a World Heritage Site in the Derbyshire Dales that exists because of the purchase of cheap cotton from the Americas. Now, are we going to are we going to distance ourselves from Joseph Arkwright? Do we do we close down the mills because of what their connotation is with 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 its past history? How far do we go with this? And I'd, I'd just like to point out that slavery just didn't occur between the in the black community it was it was white slavery when as as regards the mills of joseph Arkwright, in, including children of eight or nine years old so how how far do we go with this how how far do we do we take it are we being half-hearted or do we go the whole hog and we have we would have some serious questions to ask about how far we did choose to take this this issue thank you councillor bright Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to support this because um, I would also I'd like to be sure that we have a full review of district assets. Um, I am confident that the officers will bring forth recommendations that we will then be decided on with a local, legal, transparent and democratic process. So I'm, I'm happy to support this. Okay, Councillor O'Brien and then I've got Councillor Slack. Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've taken the opportunity to share this proposal with members of the Black and Minority Ethnic Community in my ward. Uh, their reaction is that it risks uh, falling into the same trap that uh, British white people have for uh, at least a couple of centuries. And that is we think we as uh, white people can understand and judge uh, what motivates and what impacts on people of a different uh, race and colour. Uh, the issue specifically is the use of the word we undertake in the uh, proposal and the suggestion that therefore on behalf of um, black and minority ethnic people in my ward is that we in fact enable and facilitate representatives of the B and ME community to undertake the review on our behalf and we don't presume to review uh, assets which uh, cause hurt, pain and anger to uh, others but we, as I said, enable and facilitate BME uh, people to take that and we look at the results of that review ourselves. Thank you. Um, so I would ask Jason Atkin yeah. to, to consider that change to his proposal. Okay, uh, Councillor Slack, we'll come back to the uh, proposal at, at the end of the speakers. So, um, uh, Councillor Slack. Hold on. Wait, 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 Councillor Slack, I'm just unmuting you. I'm trying to. Can you unmute yourself, please? Hold on, that's it, we can hear you now. Start again, please. Yeah. No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with many of the speakers already, especially Jackie and Claire and uh, uh, Robert. Uh, I think we've uh, this motion's all right, but it does It's not broad enough. It's, to be honest, it's not broad enough. It's too narrow. I think we've got to be inclusive of all the Black and Asian and minority groups taking part in this. Not not just whites only. It's the it's, it's more oppressive to minority groups and black nations and it is to white people so therefore they should be taking part in this review 
they should be looking at the assets to themselves, not not to us or white officers. It should be black and Asian and minority people taking the lead on this. So I'm not, I won't go against it particular, but it does. It's not broad enough for me. It's not yeah. far enough. And David says the, the white people. He's dead right. They were oppressed, dark rights, oppressed people, but the black and Asian people have been uh, oppressed more than anyone. The slavery was horrible. Taking people from their families in Africa, taking them to work on the plantations was absolutely horrible. And we must never, ever forget uh, imperialism and colonialism. Yeah, it made Britain a great empire, but the disgrace behind it is is horrible. And I can't... I can't go along. I'm undecided whether to support this or not, to be honest, Chair. I don't think it's broad enough, but okay. I'll thank wait for the views. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you very much. We've got Councillor Purdy, then Councillor Waitman. Councillor Purdy, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, of course, we could have a deep, long philosophical debate about this ad infinitum. And the simple tenant of this motion is to look at our assets, the authorities' assets. It's nothing to do with our right. It's nothing to do with anything else. Uh, and I would just ask members to support it in its simplicity. Um, and if you trust officers, then we've said it'll come back to council. Then we can have the long debate that you're seemingly wanting on it. So at the moment, I would just ask, please, we keep it simple. We keep it on authority uh, assets. Uh, and that's the aim of this debate. We can go into wider debate about other philosophical arguments on this very wide subject. Uh, we are reviewing our ethnics policies, you know, we are looking at external advice on this. So I think that's uh, for another time. This is simply to just check our assets and make sure we've got nothing that's going to cause hurt. Thank you very much. Councillor Waitman, please. I'd like to thank you, Councillor Jacob Atkins, um, for bringing the motion forward. Thank you. Lovely. OK, thank you, Councillor Pawley. I've lost you. Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, I will support it. Um, but I agree with a lot of the others to, that this is not wide enough. I'd like us to be looking not only at our assets, but our, but our practices as well. Um, I wondered if uh, Councillor Atkin would be prepared to put in the words as a first step, just so that we, can, we know that we are going to take this further. I heard earlier on that Councillor Purdy uh, saying that we are going to involve members of the BAME community to, uh, to look into uh, the, which assets we might um, review. Perhaps that's, uh, that sort of really ought to be emphasised to members of the public who are listening because that needs, they need that reassurance. They need, the, they need the reassurance that we are not as a group of white people going to look at objects that we own and say, yeah, they're all right, when they might not be. We don't know. We have no idea. So I'd like that reassurance from the leader of the council again. And I would like to ask if Councillor Atkin will be prepared to put in the words as a first step. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Atkin will, will, will sum up at the end, I think, uh, and, and, and make some suggestions. So Councillor Wayne, I've got next, then Councillor uh, Cruz. Councillor Wayne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm minded to support the motion. Um, but some of the comments are, I mean, we are predominantly a white authority uh, and most of our uh, officers, the majority of our officers are. Um, I'd like to seek some, uh, an affirmative comment from Councillor Purdy that we will get some consultation in relation to what is construed as offensive to a BAME person. I don't consider that we should just go at it from our authority. We consult in a lot of other things and we could, should consult externally with that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cruz. Thank you very much, Chair. It's just to reiterate what's already been said and, and to add my voice. I think uh, that uh, the, the motion is, uh, is, is well intended. I do think we need to seek uh, some input from minority groups from the BAME community. Uh, and I think uh, it'd be great if Councillor Atkin could consider that in the motion. And if we could have some comments from Councillor Purdy to 
to uh, to support that uh, that concept. I think it would move it forward, and I do welcome the uh, the wider work and the wider motion that will be forthcoming at uh, another meeting. And I welcome the the independent review that was requested at the emergency committee. So, uh, okay. Councillor Atkin would consider that. That would be appreciated. Thank okay. you. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Tony Morley, then Councillor Purdy to 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 make his remarks. Yes, Councilor thank you, Chair. Uh, I will be supporting the motion, and if. Uh, if it's of any interest or comfort to any members who have any problem with the wording of the motion, you've already heard from the daughter of an immigrant. Perhaps you might want to consider asking her to head up a working party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm no problem with the words in the first instance myself. It's up to Councillor Atkin. Um, it's certainly needing uh, examination. Uh, and I've got no problem with officers um, referring it to Bain. Uh, I think there's an organisation at County Council there who can help us with this. Uh, my reference earlier on was to the uh, re-examining our ethnics policy, uh, and I referred that in my Lee's announcement or a question I answered, uh, and that's where we will be looking. Okay, th thank you. Can I ask then uh, Councillor Atkin to, to sum up the, the motion and make any remarks to... to uh, to add to the debate, Councillor Atkin. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I've been listening um, quite intently to, and I take on board some of the other comments. Um, Joyce, uh, Councillor Pauly, if you wish, I will put in the motion uh, some, something along the lines of the first, in the first instance. Don't know whether, Sandra, you could um, plough that in somewhere to, to the motion for me. I'm, I'm quite happy to do that. And I'm, uh, I'm just thankful that uh, a lot of people support this. Hopefully this is the first step to a wider piece of work. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sandra, can I call Sandra in now? Yes, Chair. If you agree to the addition of those words, could I suggest that it goes in the second paragraph? We acknowledge the public outcry of hurt, pain and anger over these legacies and that we undertake in the first instance a review of our assets. That would seem yeah, to be the most logical place, if you agree. Yeah, that's fine with me, Sandra. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for everybody's contributions. I think we then go to the vote now. Uh, so we need Jackie to take the vote uh, and we'll do this alphabetically as we did before. So uh, it's a for or against or an ab abstention, please. And if you could be as clear and as precise as possible. So uh, Jackie, please, with the voting. Okay, Councillor Allison. Against. Uh, Archer. Oh. Four, did you say? Yes, four. Yeah. Uh, Atkin? Four. Bright? Four. Buckler? Against. Bull? Oh, four. 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 Martin Barefoot? He's in here. Put him here. We can't hear you, Councillor Burfoot. I'm mute, can I? Yeah. Reluctantly, four. Four. Uh, Sue Burfoot. Four. Buttle. Against. Chapman. Four. Cruz. Four. Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly. I think that's a thumbs up for four, Councillor Donnelly. That's mute. No, it's mute. It means on mute. Fitzherbert. Four. Litter. Four. Froggett. Four. Finesse. Four. Gamble. Against. Hill. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Lees. Four. Uh, Tony Morley. Four. Michelle Morley. Four. O'Brien. Against. Pawley. Four. Purdy. Four. Ratcliffe. Against. Uh, Rose. <laughs> Councillor Rose. <laughs> 
where's he gone? Would you like to stick your thumb up, Councillor Rose, if you're for, or down if you're against, if you're having difficulty? I can't see him. I can see him on screen. If you could just stick your thumb up for for, or downwards for against. If you're saying for, yep. I can see him. <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor Shirley? For. Slack? Four. Four, did he say? Councillor Slack? I can't see him. We've lost Councillor um, Slack on camera at the moment. I'll come back to him in a minute then. Yeah, I'll come back to Councillor um, Slack. Councillor Statham? Four. Sutton? Four. Spindle? Four. Wayne? Four. Wakeman? Four. Councillor Slack, are you there? I can hear me now. Uh, against. Against, thank you. One, two, three, four. I think you may have turned your camera around, Councillor Slack. We can't see you. So that's 28 for, 7 against. Against, yeah. Yeah, agree, Jackie. Good. Your pardon, I am not on, I am unmuted. A bigger problem, we're on now on item 11, building new council housing. I'm going to ask Rob Coggins to introduce this item. Rob. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, I'd like to start by introducing colleagues from Altair, the consultancy that we've been working with um, for the last year or so on this proposal. So Aaron Elliott and Matt McCormack are joining us uh, this evening. Um, this is probably the most uh, significant report I've presented to the council in my 18 years at the, at the District Council. Um, becoming a landlord again is a significant step for, for the local authority if this uh, report is approved. Uh, the business case has been developed over the last two years following a grant from the Local Government Association and Altera brought their wealth experience to support the council in the process. Previously, the Commercial Board has received two reports on earlier versions of the business case and the Community and Environment Committee agreed for the proposals to be referred to the full council. If approved, this report will see the council changing from an enabler of housing to being a provider of affordable homes once again. This will send a very clear statement of the council's ambitions as set out in the corporate plan. Members will note from the detailed specifications for development and management services, the complexity of delivering such services. These are best delivered by providers that have the in-house technical expertise and can adhere to the testing standards of Homes England and the regulator of social housing. The initial programme comprises 52 homes focusing on the purchase of section 106 homes, some new build on council land and the purchase of empty properties, plus a house bequeathed to the district council by a former resident. The programme will undoubtedly change over time as the nature of development of housing um, takes place, but the focus for rent at local housing allowance levels reflects not only the overwhelming need in the district, but also the low risk associated with financing and developing and letting of this tenure. The proposal supports the council's climate change commitment with an additional £10,000 of funding for the new build on council land and the retrofit of empty properties. Despite all the optimism and enthusiasm that you know I have for this programme and for other things we've done in the past, I am, uh, have to remain realistic about what we can be achieved um, in the short term. It will take time to build a portfolio of council housing but we believe we have set a good uh, set of specifications which we have market tested with local providers. As our experience and evolves and risk appetite changes, we can review our ambitions year on year. The specifications reflect best practice and what we believe we can effectively deliver locally. We want the council homes to be well built and well managed, giving our residents the best opportunity to flourish. We are seeking to use the existing performance management arrangements that other that the chosen contractor would, would operate, helping to keep costs down and uh, attracting uh, um, potential bidders. 
The programme will deliver a new and ongoing revenue stream to support the council's wider strategic ambitions, and 52 homes will deliver about £200,000 of income per year, though we will need to set aside a percentage each year for the provision of future major repairs. Subject to approval of this report, the council will need to register with Homes England and the regulator of social housing and the housing obligation. If approved, the, the procurement documents will go live tomorrow, and in November, the council will receive a report on the outcome of the tender process. I would like to thank the colleagues in the housing team in legal services and finance and the procurement colleagues at the County Council, along with Altair for their input and support to enable this report and business case to be presented this evening. I'm happy to receive questions again with the support from colleagues uh, Aaron and Matt. Thank you. Uh, right, okay, I've got a number of people who want to talk. Councillor Tony Morley, please. Tony Morley. Sorry, um, it's not a question. I'd like to move the report as written. I think it's a smashing piece of work. Can I do that, Chair? Yes, please. Yes, I'd like to move it as written. And I think, congratulations, Rob. It ticks a lot of boxes. Well done indeed. But I've also, in doing this, I'd like to add on, and I'd like this to be minuted, congratulations to all, mm -mm, all, all of our officers who are working flat out evenings and weekends and I happen to know some of them have even given up their annual leave in order to meet the needs of this current crisis. So, yes, it's moved. And, yes, I'd like to congratulate the staff as well. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Mark Waitman. Yes, I'd like to second it, Chair. And uh, I'd like to thank all the officers for the excellent... Uh... Thank you. Uh, Councillor Archer. Been done. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Archer. I've lost you, but there's someone. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I also really commend the report. I think it's excellently detailed, and, I've, and I fully support the uh, sentiment behind it and what it's trying to achieve. Uh, just have a, while, a couple of questions, um, however. Um, first of all, it mentions in uh, in terms of our carbon neutral by 2030 um, target, um, it says that the £10,000 per home that was, has been allocated in the budget towards that, but it says except for those from S106, which... Is a, is the large majority is nearly seventy percent of the houses. So, so um, could um, Rob just explain why that is the case um, that we're not able to put that ten thousand pounds in towards um, houses that are coming from S one hundred six? And and also, if if we're not able to, I'm sure there is a good reason for it. Um, what can we do to try and make sure that the S one hundred six house houses, which make up nearly seventy percent of this allocation, um, do have um, carbon neutral um, facilities built into them? Uh, okay, so um, Rob, do you want to, you and your colleagues, do you want to do that one now? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the new homes that we would be purchasing through um, a Section 106 programme, they would be built by a developer who, who would probably not yet know who the homes would be going to um, once the, when the scheme had started. So he would be building to um, building regulations and the standards that apply at the time when that scheme was um, <laughs> So it's very difficult to, um, for any, any housing provider to try and retrofit into a brand new house that hasn't yet been completed, um, new, new uh, energy saving features. But of course, as over time the building regulations change, um, which is obviously a central government activity, uh, we would, we, our standards would improve as we go along. So I, don't, I appreciate it's not quite the carbon neutral approach we'd want to achieve, but it's worth noting that um, the building regs actually are quite well advanced now and, and I think over time they will continue to ramp up as um, the reviews that have undertaken um, come into come into effect. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've been involved uh, with the, this proposal right from the early days when it was first brought to the commercial board and then to uh, the community and the environment. So I'm well acquainted with some of the detail so bear with me, Chair, if you will. I, I do have two questions, but I just wanted to say that as council house developments go, this is relatively modest. Uh, it just uh, entails uh, an initial seven units, uh, perhaps rising over the time to around, around about 50 or, or so. Uh, and what it's doing, as much as anything, is returning is back to those, in my mind, good old days, um, where local authorities 
uh, really did have some responsibility and control for the affordable homes that they invested in. Um, now the detail of this, as I say, the investment phase development and management has been discovered, uh, discussed many times. Uh, 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 and now it's being brought to the full council for their uh, 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 approval, ho hopefully. Um, given the low numbers and the council's management capacity, of course, it makes sense to outsource it. Uh, and that modest investment will in fact produce a reasonable uh, return. So financially, it, 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 it is sound. Now, Rob, if I may, uh, to, to you directly to you now, uh, there is some anxiety, I have to say, about perception that these houses will come under the control of a major housing association, thereby losing some of the, if you like, sensitivity and standards that members would want for homes under their direct responsibility. Can you alleviate those fears and outline exactly what are the benefits of council involvement rather than simply moving the funds to let a social housing provider do the whole job? Uh, Rob, please. And I have a second question. Thank you, Chair. I think um, Aaron could prov uh, provide the answer to this, given his independence in the in the project. Super, uh, Aaron. Thank you, Councillor Ratcliffe, for the question. Um, I think the answer is obviously we are carrying out a procurement exercise bound by procurement rules. So anyone can bid for the opportunity to be managing agent and development agent. Um, clearly, the uh, procurement documents um, uh, uh, hint at a, a local requirement and a local presence uh, and and then and, and we will obviously analyze that offer uh, from any providers as part of the process um, but at this stage we can't say for definite it won't be a, a large housing provider but but you know with, with the, the way the documents are set out it would favor perhaps more localized and, and smaller operators to, to offer the service that that, that councillors are are looking for in, in that respect okay and councillor back have had another question I'm not quite sure whether that answer was precisely what I was looking for. Okay, However, what are we looking for then? Well, it, it was this reassurance, as it were, uh, 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 that uh, the council will get benefits from this over and above the, 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 the route that we have taken in the past, which, to put, which is to provide funds to a social yeah. housing provider to both build and manage uh, those affordable uh, homes. Uh, this, this, to my mind, it, it is much more of a two-way process uh, in, in which a social housing provider uh, is facilitating the development, then becoming the manager, but the homes are actually owned by us. Now, as I say, um, there are some who would say, well, why not just give the monies, the funds to the, uh, pro to the provider in the first place? What, what are we actually getting out of it? Apologies, Councillor Ratcliffe, sorry to, to, to add further detail to that. Um, there is obviously two technical specification documents that we've worked alongside Rob and the team that um, enhance that uh, 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 sort of relationship um, between the council and the, the, art, the, the sort of, if it is a local housing association or housing association, you know, there's built in um, uh, provisions in there for, for Rob to have a more hands-on role in the, in the quality control of the management function and the um, and the development function, um, whereas where in, in circumstances where perhaps Rob's giving grants or, or, or funding to the housing associations, that relationship is a lot more arm's length, um, and this will make that relationship a lot more closer. And, and obviously, there will be the ability within those agreements if if, if the local uh, uh, provider or, or, or uh, doesn't perform, then then Rob is able to review that, and there will be termination provisions within the agreement as well if they aren't performing up to scratch in terms of the services they're providing to both the council um, and the resident. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, can I just say that uh, I, I am very much supportive of this. I am merely articulating anxieties raised by others. Now, my second question is perhaps uh, more directed to, to, to Rob for an answer. Uh, uh, and it, it is, would you make available as soon as is convenient the full details of any revised business, business plan, including the sources of funding for this program of house building. And I'm thinking that perhaps it would be uh, most useful in the uh, next report uh, to, the, to the council. Yes, of course, uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, we can make um, the information available. I think at the moment, some of it will be commercially sensitive in terms of of course, a bidder or not, so we have to be a bit circumspect there. Um, yeah, of course. I, I think oh. it's, it's worth saying that we will be able to share the specifications with other potential housing organisations like community land trusts and, and what mm. we in this process we can we can again help other organisations with in the future. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much. I've got Councillor Finesse. Can I just say that I am knocking down people's uh, hands, so don't worry oh. if, you, if you don't <laughs> think what's going on. Councillor Finesse. Well, and that's the explanation then, because I was the first to put my hand up, but it keeps going down. So it's you who are doing it, Richard, is it? Yeah, Okie as doke. I said earlier, oh, for everyone. Yeah, fine. Um, I'm a director of uh, Bradwell Community Land Trust, and we have currently have 12 houses, uh, which are managed for us by a management agent, and we've got 16 more on the way. So I'm very happy to welcome Rob to the club. Um I've just a few questions. Have we advertised for management agents? Um, if we have, how many are interested? Um, uh, our management agent is, is a housing association and, and we've only in, interviewed housing associations, uh, but could it be a private management agent? And uh, once we've got them in place, the management agent, who would choose the residents? Would it be us or would it be the management agent? Rob. Thank you, Chair. I think Aaron, perhaps you could answer right. the first question. Yeah, the, the managing agent could, could indeed be um, a, a non-housing association. I think there is a reality about the requirement for managing affordable housing that they are the ones with the most experience and evidence of being able to do it. And obviously they're regulated by the regulator for social housing, which would be a key, key requirement we would look for. Um, but there isn't, in, in theory, anything to stop private organizations um not housing associations and registered providers bidding for the work uh, and in terms of the residents the council would indeed select the residents that, that, that go into those properties um uh you know the management agreement allows for that and obviously there's on section of six homes for example there's nominations agreements that give the, the the council the right to nominate people from the housing waiting list into those homes so, so have we advertised for, for the, uh, yeah. apologies apologies the uh, uh, the um Oju, uh, it hasn't gone out yet. Uh, uh, the the oh. side of the notice, it goes out uh, tomorrow, I believe. Thank yes, you. Did you have uh, another uh, question? Rob, I should say, Rob uh, has not market tested it, so we know there is some interest already. Yeah. Chris, did you have another question? No, no, that's, that answers Sorry. my question. Thank you. I've got lots of people who want to speak, so um, if you please could be as precise and concise uh, as you go. Councillor Bright, then Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of questions and I will be quick. Um, how fast do you think you could speed up the process if we did, um, if we did borrow uh, the money to, to build these houses? Um, why not uh, a bigger proportion of shared ownership? Because they seem to be a great, uh, a great way of getting people onto the housing ladder. Uh, and what would be the payback time roughly if we did borrow the money? Who can answer that, Rob? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, there's a couple of points there. Um, Matt might want to come in, I think, or from a finance perspective um, and a business plan perspective. But I think initially I would say that um, uh, we haven't, as a council, wanted to go and borrow money for a while. So that would be a departure and would need a new um, committee resolution to do that. Um, and I'm sure Karen Henriksen would have a view on, on the best way of, of achieving uh, a decent rate if you wanted to do that. We actually have quite a lot of Section 106 income within the council. So um, the programme initially is based on um, using that, that income to, to fund development. And we have actually been able to initially um, uh, discuss potential um, 
purchase of homes for a pound on some new developments uh, where we've where we've sort of squashed together the um, the value of new homes on some sites. So there isn't a pressing need to borrow um, just at the moment. Perhaps a colleague from Alto would want to answer the point on shared ownership and payback. Yes, please. Yeah, in terms of uh, payback, because we aren't borrowing, we haven't done a specific analysis on what the payback period would be. Um, that's something I think that for further down the line, would you, if you considered it clearly, you'd analyze it at the time. Um, the question about acceleration of the program, um, the funding, uh, there's some initial funding there to, to do some of the initial schemes that have been identified within the business plan. Um, and some of the other opportunities are a bit more um, market led. So some of the section of six opportunities will depend on what opportunities come down, you know, further down the line. So if we borrowed, would it accelerate things? I don't think it would per, you know, per se really. And the council within the business plan isn't going out and buying sites in the open market, for example. The sites that it would develop on would be its own land to start with. Um, and section of six uh, acquisitions and empty homes. So, so, that, so the funding's there based on the um, based on the uh, information Rob mentioned. Um, in terms of the split between rented and, and shared ownership, um, that's sort of come about through through our uh, uh, analysis of the opportunities in the market. Um, and you know, over time, they may, that may move slightly as opportunities come forward. But I think that was our initial assessment of what what opportunities we'd seen in the market over the last couple of years. And also, what what was uh, needed to be delivered in 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 the um, in the in the district against housing need uh, in in the district. But but as I say, that that business plan, the intention I believe is to review it annually. And it might be in a year's time, you look at it and go, well, actually, we've delivered more of this and less of that. So should we target some other ten years like shared ownership? So there's flexibility there within the plan moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. I've got Councillor Hughes, then Slack Hughes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Rob Cockins on, a, on an excellent proposal. Uh, it's very thorough and the, uh, I've, I've looked at the uh, tender documents as well that were submitted with the proposal and I couldn't see anything that was missing from those. I'm sure other people may be able to, but I couldn't. Um, regarding, I've got two questions. Uh, first is um, a supplementary to uh, Councillor Radcliffe's question. And that's returning to the, the benefits of uh, council house ownership by the council, as opposed to, um, as opposed to uh, giving the money to a housing association. Am I right in assuming that um, the, uh, the, uh, the improved energy efficiency of housing is easier to provide in a council house than it is in um, a housing association house? Because uh, the housing association needs, uh, has a limited budget which it needs to spread across the maximum number of houses that it can buy. That's my first question. And that's to Rob. Yeah, yes. Rob. Thank you, Chen. Um, well, the, the underlying factor in terms of what you can build is governed by the building regulations and um, most housing associations, unless they have specific funding available, will develop to that specification. I think we have some local exceptions. So we went to the scheme at Taddington that Peak District Rural built uh, recently, and they did include uh, air source heat pumps, which was a new, um, a new thing really for the Dale. So there are specific opportunities where some uh, have uh, extra funding or have allocated extra funding. But I think Erin may, may confirm that, you know, for the Darmshire Dales to add 10,000 pounds to every property it builds or buys, that's quite unique um, effort at the moment within, within local authority uh, housing. So. It's kind of apples and pears, I think, in terms of what one organisation can do in one sector and another organisation in another sector. But everybody's trying to push the boundaries in terms of how um, green they can make their, their housing. I don't know if you want to add to that, Aaron. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the, the, the programme presents uh, the opportunity for the council to take control of development and, and add in those uh, sustainable features and, and you know, um, allow some budget for that. Housing associations, as you mentioned, they're larger development programmes. They've, there's certain efficiency drivers within those organisations as well to enable them to provide funding for development. And also uh, housing associations are in a competitive market against other housing associations. So if they put in financial monies, uh, if they sort of allow extra cost in their um, uh, appraisals competing against other housing associations, they won't win opportunities if they go over and above 
the minimum building requ regulation requirements, for example. There are lots of examples where housing associations are indeed pushing the boundary, but I think this gives a good opportunity for the council to cement that budget being put towards um, carbon neutral, uh, et cetera, initiatives and, and sustainable development initiatives. Councillor Hughes, do you have another Thank question? You. Thank you for that answer. Um, and I think that fully answers my question. Uh, the, the second question is just one uh, of, of fact, really. Um, I was wondering what the implications of establishing a housing revenue account are. Um, the, the report mentions them twice, um, and it sort of suggests that there is there are difficulties in having a housing revenue account. I was wondering uh, why, we, why we, would, we would try and avoid having one if that is the case. Rob? Yes, Chair. Uh, I think, um, again, I might, I might start off, but Aaron may add from his wider experience. Um, there's a, a limit to the number of homes you can build before you have to have a housing revenue account, and that's uh, 199. Um, that's a kind of set in stone by MHCLG, so you can't really exceed that. If, if you want to have a housing revenue account, it would involve an awful lot of work um, within the authority, um, more accountants, more central costs to try and administer that, that process. And with it comes a lot of regulation. The, the model we're proposing at the moment puts all of that work and effort to be done by the housing association who, who will have say, or, or, or any other provider who will have lots and lots of houses where they all have a rental income and, and the financial um, skills in the back office to to manage the rental income system and, and you know, distribute the funds accordingly. If we wanted to set that up ourselves, that would be quite a complicated um, process to go through. So Erin, you may want to add further detail. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just fair to say that the, um, the, the, the advice we had from uh, the regulator for social housing was that it would be 199 homes before you needed to set, or 200 homes before you need to set up a housing revenue account. Um, and that's just another account where the money goes, if you like, um, which is then ring fenced for housing activities. But uh, the current setup may, may allow some flexibility on what monies are reinvested uh, more broadly by the council. Um, so that's why um, we, we haven't set one up immediately. Clearly, if in future years the council gets to that threshold, assuming policy doesn't change, they would have to uh, think about how they do, go about setting up the housing revenue account again. Okay, thank you. Councillor Slack, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I very much welcome this because um, we're going back to where we were. It's strange how history repeats itself because after we came out of the Second World War, we was in big debt and uh, the government of the time, one of our governments, of course, uh, took it on them to build council houses and they built enormous lot of council houses in, in them years. And uh, I'm hoping that again we will repeat that and build more council houses because as we come out of this tragedy debt is going to be a great burden for everyone mortgages will be hard to get and it'll it'll we'll have to rely on socializing really but my problem rob um by 106 agreements are we taking that money away from the one of my colleagues has already mentioned it one of the taking it away from the housing association should we be going for something like public loan boards for that finance rather and take it away from other sources of affordable housing. That's my question. Rob. Thank you, Councillor Slack. Yes, um, the, the funding we've given uh, historically to housing associations has been used to support particularly rural developments where there's a higher cost to meet um, the exacting planning requirements of ourselves and the National Park. So um, that, that will continue. I'm sure we will have a, con a programme that will continue to support housing associations to build um, housing Association affordable homes in the district. Uh, the the um, the funding we we will have at our disposal will help us to build our own program as well. So it's not a case of one or the other. It's about um, both flourishing uh, and working well um, within the within the district. Okay, thank you very much. I've got uh, Sue Burford next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, um, I totally support this initiative to provide new council housing and congratulate Rob and the whole of his team on this excellent report. Um, being commercially minded as a council is something we have to embrace. And if we do this by delivering council homes for local people, then it's a win-win. Uh, I hope uh, the 52 houses is just the start. 
But in terms of um, management services and maintenance, etc., being delivered by a managing agent, I think it's absolutely crucial that we we what we get is a responsive customer service in terms of tenant inquiries about repairs, etc. Um, I think at the moment, probably quite a few councillors do get complaints from um, housing association tenants that they can't get through on the telephone and they do come to us for help sometimes. Um, how would we manage that if it was to become a problem with, with a managing agent? Um, that, that's the sort of question. I have got another comment. Do you want me to give that now? Yes, please. Could you do it now? Okay. Yes, please. So can I refer to page 10 and um, 3.7? So um, I welcome an initiative such as photovoltaics, but I'm just wondering whether we could factor in domestic sprinklers to these aims. Now, as far as I understand it, private developers don't have to do that, but we can, and I think we should. In fact, installing domestic sprinklers is much easier during the build stage. And as a member of the fire authority, I have contacted the chief fire officer at Derbyshire Fire and Rescue Service, and he very much um, supports the installation of sprinklers. He tells me they're about £1,500 at the bill stage per household, but as he says, and I quote, the benefits far outweigh this over the lifetime of a building. Um, it's, it's known that sprinklers work. Apparently, they're very successful in 99% of um, times when they are needed. Um, he also tells me, I wonder whether Rob is interested in this, that the, there is a possibility of uh, match funding for domestic sprinklers. And I could put him in touch with somebody at uh, DFRS um, if, if, if that's of interest. I really hope this is something we can do. Okay, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think colleagues from Maltair will comment on that point initially. Great. Again, or? I, I can come in on the, the management point. Yeah, so yeah. in terms of the customer services um, and the need for, for responsive customer services and repairs issues, there's a couple of mechanisms set up in the uh, tender documentation to address this. So there's a, there's a discrete uh, section at the beginning of the um, tender document for the service spec that deals precisely with customer services and indeed list responsiveness as a key element of that. Uh, and you'll see there's also a, another section on uh, responsive repairs as well. Uh, uh, the documents also ask for a set of KPIs from uh, all bidders and again, ask for specific key performance indicators that, um, that pertain to customer services uh, and resident engagement, as well as responsive pairs, uh, repairs and all of the other areas included within the specification. So it's something that will be actively monitored by the council, by Rob and his team um, in, in a, a very sort of formal and structured way. And then in terms of any, any recourse or, 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 or powers of the council, uh, that will be set up in, in the contract documentation. But there's also, of course, the, uh, the potential not to renew the contract uh, as well. So I, I think there are mechanisms uh, built in for that. And, and, and I will say, Erin uh, and I attend our fair share of, of council meetings and I think it's it's worth saying that when councillors hear about housing management social housing management it tends to be uh, generally negative and it's uh, <laughs> and actually a lot a lot of associations do uh, or sorry local uh, uh, local private providers uh, of social housing indeed uh, provide really really good services and it's just uh, it's just worth mentioning Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to have Councillor O'Brien. Oh, and then, uh, if I may, Chair, the sprinklers. Uh, uh, the sprinklers. Who's going to answer that? Uh, yeah, so ju just on the sprinklers, um, at, at the moment, with the type of development the Council intends to, to, to carry out and be involved in, um, just in terms of building regulations, sprinklers aren't a requirement. So you hear us talk about the different uh, methods of delivery and, and section six homes from developers we're unlikely to be able to get them added into the specifications for those homes. 
but there are there may be the opportunity to do that on the homes that the council build on their own um, on their own site. Certainly, that's something that could inform part of the fire strategy for, for those homes. Um, on empty homes, it will depend on the nature of the properties being bought, but that's again something that could inform be included in the specification. Uh, it's just it, it may be that it's very difficult to fit in some of the older properties that the council may end up buying as part of that process. But yeah, certainly something that. Um, it would, 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 would be in Rob's um, thinking around specification on new homes built on council land. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor O'Brien and then Martin uh, Burford, please. Oh, Brian, uh, Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, my, my question follows on really from uh, Sue Burfoot, and I think you, you, you've, you've answered uh, most of it. Um, I mean, clearly there has to be a benefit for to residents for uh, outsourcing the, the management of our of council homes, um, and typically uh, a manage, uh, the management company would deliver a fantastic service for the first three months, and then it would uh, slowly decline. What um, is written into uh, the contract such that if it's clear that um, the management service isn't satisfactory, um, how long are we tied in uh, to it? Uh, how easy is it for the council without any penalty to uh, extricate itself from a contract with an unsatisfactory provider? Thank you. Rob, who's that, Aaron? I think Matt's going to take that one. Uh, Matt. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's worth saying on that, uh, on the contract matters. I think uh, that's still being worked on, Rob, is, uh, I believe. But it, what we would usually uh, expect to see would be um, absolutely recourse where there is serious detriment um, or potential uh, for serious detriment. Um, and and, and uh, often contracts will link financial penalties to any less uh, severe failings as well. Uh, and then it's ultimately how you break down uh, any break clauses that are introduced into the contract as well um, in response to those. So those are standard terms that we see in management contracts, ALMO contracts, uh, all kind of outsourced social housing management contracts. So, uh, you know, we're, we're supporting Rob and, and the, on the team uh, to develop that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Martin Burford, please. Martin. Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'd like to congratulate uh, Rob Coggins on a very laudable report, if only a first step, of course, because most of the sites are going to be fairly small and scattered around the district, you know, small developments. But I share the concerns that Sue raised just now, and particularly Councillor O'Brien immediately before me, uh, about the future involvement that council members will have in terms of day-to-day you know, -day management of the properties. Um, of what we have now, which is rather appalling, because I suspect the tendering process will end up in uh, the housing associations, particularly platform, for instance, having uh, the best chance of, uh, of actually winning the tender and uh, obviously becoming the development and management agent. Uh, I've just been, been waiting for a month now for someone from Platform Housing to come back to me to answer a series of pertinent questions, management issues, uh, and the three or four properties in my ward, which are uh, owned by them and managed by them. So I still have this, this scepticism about future, uh, in, well, I suppose the advantage um, to members of the council in having uh, this system as opposed to uh, directly owned and controlled um, housing association property or development. So I'm wondering if uh, uh, Rob or someone else can reassure me on that particular issue. Okay, can we just put a, 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 a part of that one for a second? Is Councillor Flitter there? Uh, because I'm sorry we didn't see your hand. Was Councillor Flitter gone? He's gone, Chair. I've seen the uh, chat, Mr. I, I, I beg your pardon. I, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Rob, can you answer that question? Uh, we apologise for not seeing you. Sorry, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I would always say that, um, and hopefully members will agree, if you ever have an issue with the Housing Association property, you, sh you should let me know and I will follow it up. And I'm, I'm, only today I've had some inquiries, uh, inquiries from members to which I followed up straight away. So um, please direct any, any inquiries to me. I think... Um, you're otherwise engaged. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think the... Um, have we got Rob? Are we losing him? I'm still here, Chair. Could you start at the beginning, Rob? Sorry, could you start at the beginning now about uh, queries and, and uh, problems? Certainly, Chairman. Thank you. Um, the 
I would always say to members to contact me um, with any inquiries in relation to um, housing association issues. And I think, you know, I know from the past I've managed to, I think, answer most of the questions that come to me with support from colleagues in housing associations. So housing associations and, and other property owners want to maintain a good relationship with the, with the authority and um, they do respond well to, to member inquiries. But I think the, as we've said in the presentation so far, we have um, market tested these um, uh, specifications very closely with um, local providers and we've, we've learned from best practice in other areas as well but we've also made sure that um, certain things like um, falling into arrears we've we've gone further in how we want to flag up for example people that might be falling into arrears and have difficulty um, far sooner than a regular housing association or other provider would, would I think we've lost Rob uh, momentarily. Uh, I'm happy to come in yeah, on that. Please, Matt, that'd be on, very on, helpful. Thank on, you. Thank on, you. On, a slight, on a slightly different um, angle, just you know, firstly to say about um, just to warn uh, against assuming that any particular um, bidders' household names that operate in uh, in in the area uh, might be kind of uh, shoo-ins or favourites for, for this. Uh, what I'll say is we've been involved in several um, uh, outsourcing of, of management and development agency contracts within the social housing sector and particularly for the for the management um, bids it, it isn't a particularly mature market where there is established kind of pricing for, for example so uh, we, we have seen private providers come in and and put very um, competitive uh, bids forward uh, who, who are now very experienced in the market so um, I think when we were drafting documentation, it was absolutely with that kind of open mind, with that knowledge of how how broad uh, the market is still at the moment uh, with outsourced housing management. Um, and then it, 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 I think just to kind of um, to touch on uh, points that, that, that uh, others have raised so far, there will be more control uh, uh, exerted from the council than is possible. Uh, if you don't uh, have the stock and you aren't uh, the landlord. And, and then in terms of comparing that to, to developing an in-house um, development or, or management functions, I mean, I think what Rob was really keen to, to work with us on was, was a, a plan and an approach that was, you know, proportionate to, to the scale of, of, of what we're, we're talking about here that would, um, that would uh, represent value for money for, 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 for the council as well um and and you know not with notwithstanding that i, I think there's also um certainly a, a kind of longer term vision here that yes it you know is outsourced for the 10-year program that's been presented today but this is this is the start of the council having stock again for the first time in 20 odd maybe 30 years and it's um i think i think there is a kind of long-term vision piece to this as well as well as the the, the kind of greater level of control uh, and as I've touched on before, we've tried to, as much as possible, build in controls around quality uh, in, into the documents. Thank, thank you very much. I've got four final speakers, Paulie and Shirley, Atkin and Purdy. So, Councillor Paulie. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm coming back to the business of trying the management and problems that might arise. Um, have we considered um, for the housing that we're going to provide, having a very strong tenant associations who work with us directly rather than uh, going to the, the management team so that we can keep, a, 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 say, a, a three monthly update on what's going on in the housing that we own. Uh, because you can get one picture perhaps from the, from, uh, the management team and another from the actual residents. And not all residents are able to actually um, put into words what it is they're experiencing. They come through us, but they don't come to, through us until it's really got to quite a difficult point for them. So a tenant association might preempt any difficulties and pick them up at an early stage. Rob uh, or Matt? Matt. Yeah, just just to say again, I, I think we've been really careful in the specifications to to recognise that. And and Aaron and I come from, you know, a, a world of of, of uh, only working really in the social housing sector. So so we recognise the the value that that kind of resident engagement 
uh, brings. So uh, absolutely in, in the specification, we've been explicit about the requirement for the managing agent to, um, to, to listen to residents' ideas for improvement to the service, to absolutely record all resident engagement, report that back to, to the council um, and analyse you know, any trends in feedback, any common issues that are arising and, and be clear on how uh, they respond to that as well and, 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 and how, that's, uh, how, that's, how that leads to improvements as well as uh, regular satisfaction uh, surveys as well, again, which will feature as, as key KPIs uh, to, to the council. So, you know, I think, I think the, the regulator takes quite a clear view and clear, li clear line on the, the level of engagement that it expects um, for, 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 to be provided to social housing tenants, whether that's provided by private providers um, or, or registered providers, um, but I think we've we've tried to go uh, a step beyond that in in the specification and 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 be quite clear and robust in in uh, the approach to to customer service, but also uh, resident engagement. Really importantly. Okay, thank you. Thank may, you. May I come back on that, Chair? Yes, quickly, please. Yes, um, yes, I've I've read the specification to a certain extent, and I'm, I have missed some of the later paragraphs, but anyway. Um, I think it would be good if we could actually get involved ourselves as owners rather than just leaving it up to the to the management team because we have I'm sorry to say we do have some problems with some of the management providers that the so housing associations around here even though you say you know we've got all these these uh, indications of what they should do in place it's a little difficult to accept that uh, on that point, I would just say if 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 uh, the council was minded to encourage the establishment of a residence association, um, then there's nothing in the documentation that we've uh, produced, or nothing uh, about the approach um, that uh, that is contained within uh, this paper that precludes uh, the council from doing that. Um, uh, and again, I think I think what the, the the other comment I would have on that is is just um, to to be mindful of the scale of, of the program that we're talking about. So I think, you know, it's, it's seven units initially uh, within the first two years and 52 over, over 10 years. And, and so, you know, if, if residents want to, to establish an association and if the council wants to, to support that, that, like I said, there's nothing that, that precludes that for in, 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 in the document and, and in the, uh, uh, the approach taken. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Shirley. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just wanted to really welcome this and, um, and thank Rob, particularly for all the work he's put on and the determination he's put into this proposal um, o o over some time. I've got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, in the management agent specification, uh, it deals with assignment. Uh, and presumably this is assignment of tenancies between one individual and another. And my question is, if we... Um, encourage assignment, how do we make sure that these properties are still available for those who most need them? Um, that was the first question. Um, the second was about the actual building. How can we make sure that the design of the buildings are attractive? So we're delivering um, attractive homes that people want to live in, not just more houses. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so on on the assignment point, uh, that's in relation to a uh, leaseholder. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the shared ownership uh, units. Um, and so uh, I think just like the rented accommodation, the, uh, whoever, whoever the provider ends up being would be expected to, to follow an allocations uh, criteria. Um, that was seen to be to be fair, and then uh, as with all social housing, that is um, that is structured in such a way that it's made available to people that are otherwise uh, not adequately served by the by the private housing market. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've got Councillor Atkin. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to thank Rob and his team and Altair for bringing this forward. I know that's something the council been talking about for a number of years now, so I'm very glad now we're actually seeing. Uh, the conclusion of this and, and trying to build our own housing. So I'm, I'm very happy, I'm very supportive of this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Well, as one who was raised uh, upon a council house estate, um, I'm not a rabid Tory. I've got certain social values and I think it's very important. And I said this when I came into my leadership role that I want to see this council build some council houses. So this first step is really encouraging. I thank Rob, but particularly thank Avato 
Um, like Council Ratcliffe, I was involved in it in the beginning. Um, and like Council Ratcliffe, I'm also, and others have said, nervous about these big organisations like Platform. So I'm very comfortable by the answers tonight. And now, Chairman, you want to move on to the vote. I just want to say as leader to everybody concerned, thank you for your interest in this. With all the questions raised tonight, I've never heard so many contributions. It's been, been great. And it shows the initiative and excitement of this project with Office of Ailes. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Jackie, could we have the vote, please? So if you could all get ready, uh, you know the alphabet, I hope, uh, and get ready to <laughs> unmute yourself and uh, say uh, for or against or abstain. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Councillor Allison. Four. Archer. Four. Atkin. Four. Wright. Four. Buckler. Four. Bull. Four. Burf Martin Burfoot. Four. Sue Burfoot. Four. Buttle. Four. Chapman. Four. Cruz. Councillor Cruz. Move on. Don Councillor Donnelly. Move on. Fitzherbert. Four. Litter. Oh, he's gone. Um, Froggett. Four. Four. Did you? Uh, Campbell. Four. Hill. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Lees. Four. Tony Morley. Four. Michelle Morley. Four. O'Brien. Four. Pauly. Four. Purdy. Four. Ratcliffe. Four. Rose. Shirley. Four. Slack. Four. Statham. Four. Sutton. Four. Swindle. Four. Wayne. Four. Wakeman. Four. Now Can we I go need, back? Yeah, Councillor Cruz. Rose. Oh, he's frozen. Uh, Councillor Rose, you there? Can you put your hand up to say yes? Or th thumb up? Thumb up? I think that's a four. Yeah, that's a four. Thank you. Uh, Jackie? Councillor Cruz? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm four. And Councillor Donnelly? Absent. I think we've lost him. No, he's put his thumb up, Chair. Just so oh, right. I beg your pardon. Okay. He's four. Okay, that's unanimous then. Thank you very much. We'll have a 10 minute break. Be back at 22 minutes past eight. Thank you very much. 22 minutes past eight.
Okay, right, I think we are getting back. I've lost Sandra, hold on. Oh, is she over there? Is no, she... I'm here. Fantastic, great, okay. <laughs> I hope everyone's back in, in the room now, can hear us. Uh, and we are going to move on to the, the bit of special business, which is uh, about pavement licensing, uh, and to do with obviously the COVID-19 and the recovery process. And we've got Tim Braun to report his report that you should have had in the post today, if not on, on your emails. Tim, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I've got Eileen Tierney, our licensing manager, with us as well tonight to talk Good about question. any detail of this. It's her team that's, that's leading on it. Um, we've known for some time that government was proposing measures to enable hospitality to open back up uh, with some added benefits and to try and make some money back after the three and a bit months out of business. And on Thursday last week, we found out what it was. And we found out rather unpleasantly that it was a, a new duty that was being given to the district council, which was to license pavement cafes. These are now called pavement cafes rather, sorry, pavement licenses rather than pavement cafes. Um, the idea is that, that to help restaurants, pubs and cafes to recover from, from shutdown, uh, that the government would like to be uh, councils to be able to grant pavement licenses to enable them to uh, have outdoor dining and drinking. Um, it's contained in something called the business and uh, <clears throat> a business and planning bill. And, um, and, and one of the things it does is it, it deems planning consent for any of these licenses that are granted. It also enables uh, people's alcohol licenses to be extended uh, to automatically enable off sales as well as on sales. So there's a, there's a strong presumption in favour um, of the idea that councils will be granting these things wherever possible, rather than trying to hinder them. There's a presumption in favour of the licence being granted. Um, the point of this report was to make sure that the council had systems in, in place from day one to operate the system. At the time that I drafted the report, we were extremely fearful that the, the regime would be in place for next week for the reopening of business. It now seems from information that Ireland's had, that we're looking at later on in the month before this receives royal assent, which gives us a bit more time to prepare, which is good. Um, we've, we've, we're involved with the group across the county in trying to develop standard conditions um, with the county council's help as well, which is really good. Um, and we hope from that that some kind of standard policy on decision making will also develop so that we can, we can get on and have a standard uh, kind of basis on which we're making those decisions. You'll appreciate that all this is being done in a terrible hurry. It was announced last Thursday afternoon and we're now one week on just trying to deal with it. Uh, there are two recommendations before you today. One relates to the series of delegations to operate the new system, which I think is logical in line with our existing scheme of delegation um, and might not cause too much debate. The other relates to the fee that we can charge for these licenses. The law will enable us to, to charge a fee up to our £100 maximum. We can choose to adopt a lower free fee or to waive the fee completely. That, I think, is a political decision if you were choosing to waive the fee. As an officer of the council, I've suggested that we charge the maximum fee, which will cover the majority of our costs, although not all of them. You may choose to, to, to wish to offer these for a lower fee or for nothing. I'm happy to take any questions about principle. If there's anything on detail, I'll ask Eileen to step in as well. OK, Councillor Purdy, please. Yeah, can I just... Come in. Uh, for a hold on, I, I've got Councillor Purdy. Uh, I've got you on the list, yes, uh, Councillor Bull. Councillor Bull is just trying to say that I've got an interest in this because obviously I run a license. I, I beg your pardon. Right, I beg your pardon. I understand. Right, okay, that's noted, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, I've got lots of people on my list. Councillor Purdy. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I welcome this. I mean, when we go abroad, we all like to experience the cafe culture. It's a pity we don't get more warm, sunny weather in this country. Uh, it is a, a very good way of uh, promoting business. Uh, part of this Derbyshire Economic Recovery Board is all about, you know, kickstarting the economy. And this is one such move. And I know that you've had a bit of relief, Tim, with the, the fact that it's given you another two weeks. Uh, I'm happy to move the recommendation, but uh, I'm going to move that we do not charge a fee. I think that the traders would welcome that, and I think it would be a very good gesture on behalf of this authority. Um, I'm led to understand by you the numbers that you expect, and, and I don't think it's going to cost this, this council an arm and a leg to do that. So I propose that we uh, accept the recommendation, I'll move it, but that we um, do not charge the £100 proposed. So I suggest we move it for free. Uh, Councillor Mike Ratcliffe. Right, thank you, Chair. No, I don't agree. I think we have to stick with the fee. I was going to say that Tim might not wish to say it in public, but it does seem to me that, you know, uh, with the imposition on this small council's resource finance and staff deployment without adequate funding is getting to be intolerable. I, I, I might well agree that, you know, this is a, a, a laudable move by the government to try and uh, incentivize a return to economic recovery on the high street, bringing this sort of licensing uh, for payment activity, but it has to be backed up with um, adequate uh, uh, resources. Hold, 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 hold on, Mike. Hold on. Get back now. I mean, Thank you. Do you want? I mean, if you'd like a question, because um, it, it's very clear in the report that, that even one hundred pound does not um, recover the total cost. Uh, uh, the county council, uh, uh, though perhaps they're a more expensive authority than us, shall we say, was charging 300 plus an additional 50 um, for, uh, in circumstances. We reduce it to 100. You know, that is, uh, uh, that's undercutting ourselves because it's still going to cost us more than that to, to actually exercise this uh, in my estimation um so you know my uh support is for the recommendations as they stand okay thank you very much i've got uh, councillor hobson next thank you chair um, i'm going to agree with councillor purdy here i'm happy to uh, support this uh, recommendation uh, that the council charges no fee service. We're talking of Dale's businesses that have suffered so much through the lockdown, starting with Mother's Day and missing out on Easter, Father's Day and the bank holidays and all this glorious weather. I'd like this council to continue to assist our businesses following this COVID crisis and particularly with the issue of this one year license only. I'd also like to thank Tim and Eileen for this report. I'm also aware that once again, our officers and staff have been given additional work to deal with over a very tight schedule. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Cruz next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, previously said about the additional work that's being loaded on, on the staff, uh, Tim, I'm just wondering, what's your estimate in terms of how much actual time this is going to take? How much of your resources is this going to consume? And could you put a cost on it? What's your estimate, please? Thanks, Chair. We're, 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 we're gearing up to deal with maybe 100 applications, that kind of order of magnitude. And how much time will it take, Tim? That does... the, the process of actually granting the, granting the licence or determining the licence is an administrative one and shouldn't be too difficult. The difficulty, the difficulty comes in if you start getting complaints about them and have to deal with enforcement and, and regulation and compliance. That's when the time really comes in. So, it, so there'll be a short, sharp burst of applications, we think, and then we'll pick up on the aftermath of that as we go along. Okay, thank you. Councillor Atkin. 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I mean, full support of the motion with the amendment of uh, not charging for this. I think, as Councillor Purdy suggested, we, we do need to do something for businesses and to waive this to enable them to generate funds themselves, I think, is a, a laudable thing to do. So I, I agree with the, the motion is put by uh, Councillor Purdy and seconded by Hobson. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Swindle. Thank you, Chair. Um, Tim's answered my question, which was uh, an estimate on the number of applicants that, that he would envisage having. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go with this and for the um, to waiver the, the charge. Uh, I can understand what Councillor Ratcliffe is, is saying with regards to a need to cover our administrative costs, but I think we need to help businesses and in helping business secure jobs and so forth. And we've got to bear in mind some some of these licensed outlets probably won't have much choice other than to take their business outside. Um, so let's give them a helping hand. Thank you. Okay, Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two questions and a comment. Uh, first question is... So, um, excuse me, I beg your pardon. So we need a motion to continue for 30, uh, 30 minutes. Might you propose that, please, Councillor O'Brien? I propose we continue for another 31 okay. and minutes. And I see a second, oh, Councillor oh, Michelle no. Morley. Is that, is that all agreed? That's all agreed. Thank you very much. Sorry, could you continue? I beg your pardon. Thank you. Uh, sorry, two, two questions and a comment. Uh, first question um, on the delegation, um, which, which I support the principle of. Uh, it gives the decision-making process entirely to uh, our officers. Um, Will there be an opportunity for members to consider the policy on which uh, decisions are going to be uh, made uh, to refuse or approve applications uh, before this comes into effect? And my second question is, could you set out on what grounds an application uh, would be rejected? If you want to answer those questions, I'll give you my comment afterwards. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien. If I could do them in reverse order, because I'll probably bring Eileen in on the first question. So the grounds on which they might be rejected will be highway safety as the first port of call. We're already working with the County Council on the set of standard conditions relating to highway safety. Um, the other conditions mainly relate to public safety and to the prevention of nuisance. Um, there is a, as I said in, in, in my introduction, Planning consent is deemed granted for these, these licenses. So, so things like aesthetics and setting and general planning issues are not expected to be considered, but we are expected to deal with issues that relate to coronavirus. And we are expected to make sure that the, the things are safe to use. So that's what we're working up at the moment. In relation to the policy, um, when I thought this was going to be coming in next week, there wasn't gonna be an awful lot of time to write a very detailed policy. We were gonna to have to wing it really. Um, we've now got a couple more weeks to, to think about that, and it may be that we have time for another, you know, the next council meeting will come into play before um, before we have to start granting these licences. I think, could you could you perhaps just say when they, when we're now expecting this to come into force, please? Yes. Uh, good evening. Um, <clears throat> well, the. Uh, Business and planning bill that's wending, winging its way through Parliament almost as we speak is due to be, uh, I think it's its third uh, third reading, second or third reading on the 20th of July. So, so there is a delay. I mean, we were expecting all the readings through the House of Commons and the House of Lords to have been completed this week. Um, but but the, the date set is now the 20th of July. And after that, then there will be um, the process of amendments for consideration and then obviously royal assent is the last stage I, i'm not sure what the time scale is between the um third third reading in the house of lords and the assent i mean sandra or legal may well be able to advise on that but i don't imagine it's going to be very long i think the idea is to get the legislation in sort of asap so we're kind of now working um instead of to next week panic that we had and um, we're now working towards the end of this month to have all our processes in place and as Tim says we would be in a position um, to bring a policy of sorts um, back to the next council meeting if, if that's what members wish for. Thank you, Brian. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, it'd be very helpful. Uh, my, my comment relates to, to fee. Um, I'm all in favour of um, supporting our local businesses. But let's bear in mind we've got many, many thousands of residents whose lives have been turned upside down uh, during this pandemic crisis, um, either working short time, out of work or liable to use their jobs. We have no hesitation in continuing to charge them £50 a year to empty their green refuse bins. We don't show any consideration for the economic suffering that our residents uh, so I'm quite happy to support uh, a, a no fee, so long as we show some parallel consideration to our residents in, in respect of our, our green bin fee. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Michelle Morley. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> at first, when I, when I first read this, I thought that a fee of £100 was actually quite fair, but then I started to think about it more carefully. Um, and the businesses that have had the rug pulled from under their feet, literally. Um, and I think we have to bear in mind as well, because when you're in business for yourself, you, you put your absolute all into it in terms of savings. Maybe the houses are up for collateral. We don't know. Um, so I fully support um, this um, um, motion and also to, 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 to second it, if, if, if need be, with a no fee. And I think it will be a superb thing to support our, our local businesses in the area because I feel they deserve it. Thank, thank you, Chair. Councillor, Councillor Bull. And then I've got Paulie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, one of my comments being, I know um, Tim has said about his working with County Council, but I'm just a bit concerned to the fact that, you know, uh, some of the money that the district actually helped pass over to the county to help um, in the COVID restrictions on the pavement widening and the likes. How is that going to come into force? Because it seems now we've, we've given money over to, to circumstance that issue um, for social distancing, having widened roads and one-way systems and the likes, and now suddenly we're spreading out onto the, onto the street. So where does that money that we've put over to help with that put us on this situation now. I can come in on that, Chair. Yeah, um, Steve, Steve Capes and I met with the County Council this afternoon, um, specifically in relation to the Town Centre Reorganisation Project. And we're doing that on a pretty much a weekly basis at the moment. Steve Leeds and I, I go along and talk about bits and pieces. One of the bits and pieces I talked about today was the pavement cap, the pavement licensing side of things. Um, some, of the, some of the people who are on that from the County Highways are also involved in the pavement licensing work. So the whole lot is being tied together. The intention is not to circumvent all the work that has been done, but to try and build in safe outdoor dining into that whole equation. It doesn't mean that there will be cafes on every, every pavement. Not all pavements will be suitable. If we think about Ashbourne, for example, Council Mrs. Bull, um, there are some narrow pavements there where it would not be appropriate to have tables and chairs outside because people would be walking in the road and getting run over, you know, in its simple terms. So, so we are aware of that, that kind of tension and we're making sure it's taken into account. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pauly. Councillor Pauly. Have we lost you? Sorry about that, my mouse wouldn't work. Um, yes, uh, uh, what I want to ask, um, uh, first, first of all, I've got two questions I want to ask. But I've got a whole list of questions here that have been given me by Matlock Bath Parish Council. Um, and I understand, Tim, how you're in a dire straits at the moment about workloads. But I will not ask these questions tonight if I can send them to you separately. Is that all right? I, 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 Tim, thank you. Said, yes, is that OK? That's fine by me, Councillor yeah. Mr. Pauly, and it will help speed the meeting up. So that's good. That's right, yeah. we've got so, some other... so I, I wouldn't have done that if we'd have been able to ask right. questions in advance, but the papers okay. came too late. That's right. Okay. Um, okay. So can I ask two questions, please? Uh, yeah, um, quickly, please. We've got a lot of people on this one. Yeah, I know that. But I've got right to ask. Of course. Right. So um, the first thing is, um, are we working with the County Council on the um, aspects of pavement control that are nothing to do with putting out tables and chairs and racks and uh, things to do with businesses, such as ice cream cone advertising and um, flags and all that type of clutter. 
that has not been removed for years. Will we will we be working on that because that will that will add to the to the dis difficulties of social distancing. It's already a problem. You start putting tables and chairs out, it's going to be a bigger one. That's my first question. And the second one is, um, will pavement licensing revert back to county at the end of this year, that one, that year period? Okay, so a couple of quick answers to those couple of quick questions. Thank you, Councillor Sapoli. Um, uh, in relation to the pavement clutter, yes, there are a number of things there. Firstly, we had a team of environmental health staff out across the district on Friday and Monday, Friday last week, Monday this week, looking at our town centres and pointing out areas where social distancing could be improved. They'll be engaging with the, the various shopkeepers and restauranteurs and so on uh, to encourage them to bring those things in and reduce the amount of clutter on the street. Uh, Steve and I also mentioned that to the County Council today and um, told them what we were up to, which they're very happy about. But we also pointed out that at the end, some of these businesses might not take their stuff in um, and there needs to be an enforcement situation to fall back on. And the County Council have gone away to think about that. So, so we are dealing with that gradually. Um, in relation to where this will go in a year's time, we honestly don't know. Um, what I would like to think, whether pavement, pavement licensing remains with us or, with, or goes to the County Council, and at the moment, the Highways Act enables either the County Council or a District Council to do it. It's just in Derbyshire, it's always been the County Council. Um, wherever it goes after that, we'll just have to deal with it. What I would like to think is that there would be a um, more of a recognition of other aspects, not just the, the immediate safety concerns, but things like aesthetics. Some of the things that Councillor O'Brien spoke to me about earlier today in relation to planning um, for these things. Um, that that would all be taken into account as well. And of course, we'd, we'd, if that happened, we'd come back to you with a review of the fees. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bright. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> when I read this, I was initially uh, concerned about the fee, uh, but so I'm glad that we are going to get rid of the, the fee. Um, I did initially think that maybe a, a sort of a fee of a temporary events not, not license would be the, uh, the best way forward, but, but no fee is good. Can I just ask, is this going to be open to new businesses or is it pre-existing businesses? Because I can envisage a lot of people taking advantage of this and say, opening up, uh, uh, would it exclude parks, for example? So would somebody be in a position where they could open a, a beer garden or, or what have you? I'm just trying to think where this could go. Um, if uh, Tim could answer that or whoever, that'd be great. There's a number of parts to that. Uh, for existing license premises, uh, there is also a part of the bill that talks about um, automatically granting a variation so that they can use their own land for off sale So consumption can take place in car parks and other places that they've got, which might not otherwise have been available. Um, in relation to land that we own or manage, such as our parks or bits of land around the various towns, we're proposing that we adopt the same system for those as we will for pavement licenses. So they're all considered on their own merits. Um, the legislation doesn't limit the ability to get a license to businesses that are already in existence. So a new business that opened up would have a right to apply. Doesn't necessarily mean they get the grant, get the license, of course, but they'd have a right to apply. I hope that answers all your questions there, Councillor, Councillor Bright. If anything else, come back to me. Okay, then Martin Burford, then Gamble. I'm putting them in the chat box so we can move on. Councillor Martin Burford. Okay. Thank, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I think I go along with the uh, excellent report that Tim has prepared at short notice. Uh, I think that I think it's right to waive the fee of hundred pounds, but uh, I do share some of uh, Councillor Bryan's concerns about that. But given such a tight time scale, is it not likely that any applications uh, will not be granted before the end of the summer? Uh, it's unlikely, therefore, to be very attractive in the late mm -hmm. autumn or winter. And I don't think we want to be condoning outdoor heating uh, on the highway, do we? Uh, I think the, the questions we're going to ask about uh, highway obstruction and so on, and and uh, the need to consult with the county council about uh, traffic issues and obviously social distancing versus passers, pa uh, pedestrians who are passing by. I think those have probably been answered, but uh, it's, certainly, it's, it's a time scale that probably, probably concerns me more. But I can't see if it's not going to be going through or even start or even going through parliament until the end of July. Um, it's going to be rather, probably September before any of these get approved. So okay. perhaps I'll take Tim, please. I agree with you completely, Councillor Burford. We, that's one of the reasons we thought that the legislation would be rushed in to make the best of the, what remains of the summer. Um, but we'll deal with whatever time scale we're given and, and rest assured we do it as efficiently as we can. Uh, Councillor Gamble, please. 
That's it. Well, I've got, uh, hopefully, uh, um, might be a compromise for the fee because I think we should be charging the fee. But uh, what I propose, I'm just asking Tim, is it, is it feasible to charge, um, straightforwardly charge £100 to the business that have already had a coronavirus grant from us anyway? And for the ones who maybe haven't, who have fallen through the crack, for them to put in for a discretionary grant to cover the £100. And that, then hopefully we're not losing the money, then either, and no other business, businesses are incurring undue expense. Tim. All things are possible, uh, Chair. Um, that, that would add a bit of an extra administration into the system. Um, but it could be done if that's what the will of council is. As I said, um, in briefing to this really it's a political decision in relation to in relation to the fee um uh, a, a, another alternative we charge 58 pounds for a street trading license which is what we reckon it costs us to administer um th this is going to take a lot more enforcement I, I don't mind one way or the other we'll we'll deal with whatever you, you you would like to propose um but i think it's a you might like to consider what gesture you're sending out to business perhaps okay councillor cruz Oh, no, hold on, I've got next, Wayne. Sorry, Councillor Wayne. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm all supportive of business, um, but I just need to know a couple of questions, really. Is drinking going to be ancillary to a meal? Um, so basically, are we going to support the main reason of having these uh, locations on pavements is for food and then the drink is ancillary? The second question, is, is it feasible that this money, £100, could come from approximately £10,000, if your 100 is correct, Tim? Um, is that, could that come from the 740 k that the government kindly donated to us, uh, if there's any of that left, of course? Uh, and the second thing is, does it have to be within the curtilage of the existing premise? So what I'm saying um, is, could they adopt another area close by? Is that feasible? Thank you. Tim. Okay, Chair, the, the answers to those questions are no. Um, the, the drinking doesn't have to be ancillary to a meal. Um, that's in the legislation and not at our discretion. Um, the answer to the second question about could it come out of the money? Well, there are further announcements being made about further tranches of grant to local authorities. And, and you know, we've worked closely with Karen to make sure that we reflect on all our lost income. And I'm sure we could put that into the equation as well. Um, and thirdly, yes, um, businesses could apply for areas that are not within the curtilage of their business. There could be a sharing of areas as well. It's something that's already been proposed and worked with, for example, on some land that the, this council happens to own. Um, so we, we can think about all those things. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got Councillor Cruz next. Thanks, Chair. I'm actually OK. I, I didn't raise my hand, but uh, thank I you. I beg your pardon. Councillor Archer. Yeah, just a very quick quick one. Obviously, these measures have been put in place to try and encourage more people to come to the towns and develop businesses, which is excellent. But I'd just like to point out that we need some people to actually be in the towns to make these, these measures worth putting in place. And, and something that will really help with that is if we could do something about the car parking charges. So instead of people going to Belper and or Utox to where they can park for free, um, they can come to Ashbourne potentially and Matlock can park for free. And then actually there might be some people using these new spaces. I don't know if there's any way we can consider... If we can consider waiving the hundred pound fee for this, can we not consider waiving for at least a period while we get our businesses back on their feet after this? I think, we've, I think we've got this motion on the table, and that's what we're discussing now. But your point is is, is well made. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor uh, Tony Morley. Then uh, Councillor Buckley. Buckley. Quick question for Tim: Does this apply to all licensed premises, please? Uh, okay, it applies to all licensed premises and unlicensed, where the main purpose is the sale of food or drink. Brilliant. Coming back on that one, then I shall be supporting it and it will be an absolute lifeline to the pubs in the south of the district who've been struggling along because they can go outside in their larger car parks and it may well save up tens of jobs. And also, I'm going to go all socialist on this one and say give it them for nothing and don't charge. OK, thank you. So, um, Councillor Butler, I think your question's been answered now. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yep. Yes. Sorry. It was. Um, I. It's not clear from the report to me whether this is about the licences for the use of the pavement or for the sale of alcohol. It's, this is. This is required by um, premises which are licensed to sell alcohol. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Chair. The, the report's about the licence for pavement, but it does apply to premises that are licensed for alcohol as well as those who sell food. 
There are further bits of the bill that deal with um, variations of licenses, which are not discretionary. The council has no decision-making power on those. Uh, Anything else? Uh, so so uh, cafes which don't sell alcohol would be required to obtain one of the licenses, one of the licenses through this? They would, they would need a pavement licence, they wouldn't have to get an alcohol licence. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Waitman and then Slack, please. Councillor Waitman. Yes, Tim, um, would this also, um, would they be allowed to put tables out on to a pedestrianised area when the road is closed? Um, yes, if, if that meets with the standard conditions and so on, yes, they would, Councillor Waitman. Brilliant. Thank you. Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, uh, I think uh, we should uh, give it full support and uh, I don't think we should charge because the business have uh, had a torrid time this last year and, and many of them won't survive. But we've got to give them every opportunity to, to help them out in this instance. And spreading out, same as in worse of marketplaces, two pubs at either side of the marketplace could be used and the wheat sheaf could use their car park. It's, it's, they could, uh, it's only a short... Uh, frame of time though unfortunately by october it wouldn't be it would get cold at nights and uh, it's only a short span but we've got to give them every this opportunity to to help thank, thank you very much we shouldn't charge thank you councillor hill and then we take the vote please ladies and gentlemen councillor hill allison Uh, can you unmute? Unmute, Alison. Uh, I was just mentioning uh, who's going to be responsible for keeping the pavements clean after they've been open through the evening. Um, and Councillor Wakeman mentioned pedestrian areas being closed. Uh, they're never closed. They'll need access for emergency services at all times over. Tim. Okay, thank you, Chair. The standard conditions we're looking at would make it clear that responsibility for clearing up rubbish would rest with the licensee. Um, we're also proposing, uh, we're only required to consult with the Highways Authority, according to the bill. We're expecting to consult with the emergency services as well as a voluntary thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now go to the vote there. Thank you for your contributions, Jackie. Yes, Chair. Um... Councillor Allison. Abstain. Archer? Four. Atkin? Four. Wright? Four. Buckler? Abstain. Bull? Abstain. Bur Martin Burfoot? Four. Sue Burfoot? Four. Buttle? Four. Ch oh, Chapman's gone. Cruz? Four. I think Councillor Donnelly's left, hasn't he? Um, Councillor Fitzherbert. Four. Litter, um, Froggart. Four. Vaness. Four. Gamble. Abstain. Hill. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Lees. Four. Tony Morley. Four. Michelle Morley. Four. O'Brien. Four. Hawley. Four. Purdy. Four. Ratcliffe. On the principle of charging, I abstain. Rose. Was it four? Four, thank you. Uh, Shirley? Four. Slack? Four. Uh, Statham? Four. Sutton? Four. Swindle? Four. Wayne? Four. Wakeman? Four. What's the numbers, please? Seven, four, five abstentions. So the motion is passed. Thank you very much. Can I do a point of order, please? Uh, we're going on to. Uh, Can I just do a point of order? Can I ask? What's your point of order? 
what did what did we actually vote on? Because the recommendation said a doctor in a fee of hundred pounds, and I don't remember hearing sure. anyone amend the recommendation. So did you just vote the recommendation? I think the proposer. I'll, I'll check with I'll check with um, Sandra. The proposer um, withdrew that and said it would be nothing. Who Correct, was the Sandra? Sandra, can we have Sandra for clarification, yeah. please? Yeah, we can. The mover and seconder vote um, propose that there should be no charge. Okay, and it'll be right. on you, you can watch it back on YouTube later. Okay, okay. I'd, like to, Thank I'd you. like to go to item eighteen now, please, Tim. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, this is a report that's being introduced to enable us to um, to get on and make some more alterations to the town hall to make sure that's COVID secure for when we open up again to the public and for the staff who are gradually returning to work at the town hall. I'm conscious that time is very short, so I wasn't going to say an awful lot more about it. But Mike Goldsworthy, who is the true author of this report, is here to answer any questions you might have about this or about the risk assessment that accompanies it. Mike. I've lost you. Oh, no, I'm done for here, Chair. OK, great. Um, yeah, so just, it's a fairly self-explanatory report. Uh, just two things to add to it. The risk assessment that forms the uh, appendix to the report, like all risk assessments, is under constant review. Uh, and it's moved on somewhat from the risk assessment that's already there in the report. We're constantly looking at it and we're constantly taking uh, into account new guidance that's coming in from, from government and from uh, other sources. The one other point I would make is that um, the works outlined in the report are designed to make the building um, safer for staff to use and when the time is felt right for um, the public to uh, come into the building to reception and that sort of uh, area to make that safer to use so both for the for staff and in the future uh, for customers uh, and the public but the one point I would make is there is quite a substantial cost to these works as this can be seen from the report but Whilst the works will improve the building and the usability of the building and the safety um, for use by staff um, and the public with regards to COVID-19, they are actually long-standing improvements that will improve the, few, the security uh, and the usability of the building in the future. So they're not just for COVID. We need to bring them in now in response to that but they do have a future value as well. So that's all I would say on that, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, well, obviously I can understand that this, because there is a lot of government guidance, but obviously it's a public area, um, and we do have to keep members of the public safe, as well as our staff. Um, I think COVID is with us for a long while. I know Mike's just actually said that this is something that will help improve security for the town hall as well. So I would like to propose some recommendations. I know it is a fee again, but I think in the long run, it will be well worth spent. Councillor Atkin. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm very supportive of this. And I think the £40,000 we're going to spend on making the town hall more safe and improve for COVID-19 and in the long run is money well spent so i'm quite happy to second this chair. thank you councillor purdy thank you chair um, i'm pleased that we can combine future proofing of the building it was long uh, needed so incorporating that in this future planning and the necessity to have to deal with this for covid i thank mike for his work and uh, support it thank you councillor finesse unmute unmute I was, I, was, uh, I was just going to second it, but it's been done. Sorry. Correct. OK, Councillor Wakeman. I was going to second it as well, but right. it's been done. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Slack. Yes, Chair, I, I support it, Chair. It's what's needed, and it? It, can be the, it wants improvement in that area. OK, thank you very much. I've got nobody else on my list to... to uh, to speak. Can we take the vote, please, Jackie? Uh, Councillor Allison? Four. Archer? Four. Atkin? Four. Wright? Four. Buckler? Four. Bull? Four. Martin Barefoot? Four. Sue Barefoot? Four. Buttle? 
Four. Chapman. Oh, sorry, he's gone. Cruz. Four. Fitzherbert. Four. Froggett. Four. Finesse. Four. Gamble. Four. Hill. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Lees. Four. Tony Morley. Four. Michelle Morley. Four. O'Brien. Councillor O'Brien. He's not there. I don't know. That's a four. He's put his thumb up. Okay. Sure. Oh, yeah, was, I was, my mind was somewhere else. Four. <laughs> uh, Councillor Pawley. Four. Birdie. Four. Ratcliffe. Four. Rose. Never see Councillor Rose. Can somebody see Councillor Rose? You're saying four. Four, Jackie. Four. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Shirley? Four. Slack? Four. Say them. Uh, my iPad went off during the item, so I'll have to abstain. Okay. Sutton? Four. Swindle? Four. Wayne? Four. Wakeman? Four. That's uh, just one abstention then. So the, the, that motion is carried. Thank mm. you very much. Sandra, I fear we have no time for any more um, tonight, do we? No, Chair. I suggest that you adjourn all business to a future meeting. We've, okay. Can I do the, I... the sealing of documents? Yeah. Uh, can I take it? Um, you've all had the sealing of uh, documents. I'm going to move that. I see a seconder in... Second, um, Chair. Uh, Councillor Purdy. All those in favour? It looks okay to me. Nobody's... Uh, that's, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We have set a date of July the 15th uh, for our next meeting. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much, uh, members. Thank you so much to all our valuable officers and all the staff in and around Derbyshire Dells to do a cracking job. Keep going. Thank you very much. And good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.